Happy Saturday to you all. Playing through that 66 Marshall. Let me switch it off now. It's got a bit of a hum to it. I think it's got either uh, an issue with the uh, filter cap, which was changed by the previous guy, or it might have a bad uh, EZ81. There are a lot of people here already. I'm delighted to see all this. Hey, Todd Janney. Uh, I am not familiar with a Roger Pinto. Ooh, good question here for Paul Johnson, a tricky one. A, uh, it is really hard to, to uh, substitute for six uh, BK11 tubes and Ampegs because there are three triodes in that tube rather than the two triodes you'd have in SL, 6LCL7 or 6SN7, or other things which have roughly the same size, because the, uh, the 6BK11 is three triodes. One thing you can do, um, or a tech, a clever tech can do for you with that, is to replace the three sections of the 6BK11 uh, with uh, L and D150 uh, uh, MOSFETs. And those can be done in such a way that they behave like a 12AX7 triode. There are issues with that. You've got to have some zeners for protection so they don't uh, destroy themselves. But you can pretty much substitute an LND 150 for a triode. Um, it behaves a bit more like a Pinto, but you can, mis you can tweak it. And I'm sure that the next MPEG that comes in... Uh, where we need a 6BK11, or the there's one or two other variants of those uh, three triode tubes that Ampeg used that are just semi-impossible to get these days. So next one that comes in, I might have to go down that path. But the other option is just to find a 6BK11 and pay the $100, $200 uh, to get the amp working. It, you know, it's expensive to have a tech do what I'm talking about, but then you wouldn't have to worry about it again. But it's also expensive to find a, uh, an existing good quality 6BK11. Uh, there's no great solution for that, sorry. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. And another question he's asking, he's working on an old Gibson G8 uh, 86 Ensemble. <laughs> ensemble. <laughs> Why would they connect the two 12x7 heaters to the 5081's cathode resistor? There's 25 volts DC there. Reduces noise? Well, it depends. I don't happen to have that schematic in front of me, and I don't know um, uh, off the top of my head what they did there. Did they connect one of the heaters directly to that? I doubt that, unless they're doing a DC heater. And it may be that the, the, the heaters for those two 12x7 tubes, X7 tubes are being run off that 25 volt DC, half of which is roughly 12 and a half volts DC. You could be that you could be referring to that, in which case they're doing like you might find in a PV with a uh, series DC resistance, a DC voltage rather on the uh, heaters, or it could be that they just have some um, uh, resistors forming an artificial tap from the heater supply reference to that 25 volt DC in which case you have an elevated supply. Uh, you'll have seen me do that in many cathode bias stamps on this channel. But without uh, knowing the GA86 better, I cannot be more specific. Sorry. John L. Thanks, John. He says, uh, is there a reason all the chats do not show up anymore on playback? Um, I thought that was an issue as well, and I think I have the solution. If you're watching on a phone... With the YouTube app, in this case an iPhone, maybe the same for Android, and you uh, have a video up, in this case a chat, you know, one of these live streams, my channel or any other channel, and you have it vertical like this, so you have all the stuff here and you see the little win uh, window up top, you won't see uh, the option to go to the live chat. But if you rotate it, at that point, there'll be a little box there, the ones for, the, for, for comments, ones for the chat, so it only appears in the landscape mode, at least on my iPhone. Um, that may be the case for what you're uh, viewing as well, if it's Android or iPhone, or it may be the case 
with iPads as well, but I always keep my iPad in landscape. So um, I never tried it in portrait. I don't. It's probably the same app between the phone and, and the iPad. As far as I know, it's 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 still there all the time in, in a browser for YouTube.com versus using the YouTube app. Four says, hello, good coffee to you all. I may be uh, jumping back on the coffee train in a little bit. Um, right now, I've got something else to drink. It's just Diet Dr. Pepper, or actually it's Coke Zero. Um, I had like five cups of coffee this morning, had a slow start, and I really needed to get going. But for just the moment, I'm a bit coffeeed out. It, 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 it's wearing on the mouth after a while. Bobby Childers asks how to get into amp repair, and I've answered this a lot in a lot of live streams. Start with pedal repair. Uh, learn circuits, learn soldering, learn troubleshooting on pedals where it's 9 volts. And you cannot kill yourself. It will not catch on fire. And if you make a horrible mistake, you're probably out 40 bucks, not 400 bucks, et cetera, et cetera, or, or quite a bit more. <clears throat> so I would suggest learning how to build pedals. Uh, you can go to build your own, buildyourownpedal.com, B-Y-O-B, B-Y-O-P or whatever it is, and get kits with instructions, uh, Mojotone sells kits, uh, Stu Max sells kits. Get some of those, build them. Um, get good at it. Get you know, make it get good to you, and then maybe start with a, a champ build. Uh, don't start off going for a deluxe reverb or a Marshall or anything. You'll you'll just be like one of those guys who who bought an old Camaro to to fix it up, and seven years later it's still on blocks in his front yard. If if you don't hurt yourself, uh, and specifically. Um, Merlin Blinko's site, valvewizard.co.uk, is a fantastic resource. Uh, hey, Christopher Butler, how are you doing, man? Uh, let's see, v Vinicius uh, Magares, Magares I'm, I'm sorry, the Portuguese um, vowels threw me off, Magares, um, asks if I should, could do a video about guitars up to a certain price point. Well, I could, but it would just be something to do to be a, a YouTube channel. I have tremendous experience with most of the amplifiers on the market. Not all, but most of them. So when I give an opinion from a text perspective on an amplifier, that's, act, that's coming from actual experience. It's not like, oh, I, I, it's pretty or I like the, the way the knobs look. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I know what I'm talking about. With guitars, um, I don't keep up with the entire market. Um, unless you own a guitar store, you cannot really have enough experience with enough different guitars at different price points to have an informed decision, unless you become one of those channels where they get all the new releases from all the major companies and they say everything's great. It, to be fair, not everyone out there does that. Um, uh, you know, I, I've seen Rhett uh, Shul be critical of guitars he was sent. I've seen Paul Davids be critical of guitars he was sent. So it's they're not all shills, but you know, I can't afford to get thirty guitars a year because I have to buy them. The amps that you see on the channel are someone's amp that they sent to me for service. Occasionally, I will borrow an amp like I did with the Sir Ombre and uh, one of the Freedmans just to show you guys. Hey, this is what makes it tick. This is what's inside. And after that, after I've been inside the amp, do I have an opinion on it? But um, I don't get sent things um, for free uh, to do paid reviews or to keep or any of that. So I, I would not have the time to expand into that even if I had the inclination. So you could ask someone like Phil McKnight, who's also a good resource, who, who, who does that. And I think he buys an awful lot of the guitars keeps the ones he likes, sell, flips them after he reviews them. There are channels like that um, where you could get a better idea of that. But I, you know, I, I like what I like. And aside from that Yamaha Revstar and maybe the, the uh, SEDGT uh, or maybe some of the Ventura stuff, there's not a lot of sub-$1,000 guitars uh, that I would personally be interested in. And... Um, by the time I had them ready for, for how I would like to use them, they're probably approaching fifteen hundred dollar guitars. Um, you know, I think that's enough of that. I, I don't think that I'm qualified enough to, to to do what people want, 
And the only way I'd be in a position to do that would be to change everything about what I do and what the channel is. Hey, Gorilla Groby, what is your take on the Soldano SL100 or 30 circuit and build quality? I only know the Soldanos from the 80s and 90s, you know, the, the big SLO 100s and 50s and hot rods, which are phenomenal in every way. Uh, I don't know what's going on now with the, with the 30 and uh, the ones built at Boutique Audio Distribution. I, have, I, ha I hope they're fantastic. I hope they maintain Mike's tradition of quality and excellence, but I, you know, so well wishes, but I have no experience with them, therefore I have no opinion of them. I feel like I just jumped into all this today, like, hey, just rapid fire questions, but um, you know, I see so many people here with questions, let's get started. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll take requests if anyone wants to hear anything else of that, to the 66 Marshall, but even with the 57 here, oh, 10 feet away from it. Uh, I can only, I can't turn it up more than that, or this will clip. It's it it's a very loud eighteen watts. Hey Rob F, no, thank you for spending your afternoon with me. That goes to all of you. I mean, I'm just a madman talking to himself in his room, and and you guys make this uh, have whatever sh shred of sanity and dignity it, it might have at the end of the day. Travis, that's great to hear. Thank you very much. He's signed up for Bruce Segnator's amp design class in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, uh, can't say enough good things about Bruce. You'll, you'll love it, you'll love it, you'll love it. And send him and his wife my love. Let's see. And Christopher Butler says he's playing a Sire T3 that he got as a gift, and he thinks it's fantastic with an actual rosewood fingerboard. I've only seen, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of the Sire bass reviews, and they seem to be well-built instruments, so aesthetically not my bag. And The only Sires that I've seen for guitars, or at least the videos that I've watched, have, have been uh, our buddy John. And uh, it's a bit tricky with John because everything sounds good when he plays it. Um, Again, I've got a 335, I've got a Tele, I've got Strats, so the Sires haven't been that appealing to me. But at that price point, Sire and, and PRS and Yamaha are using real rosewood, and uh, the Ventera uh, and, and Squire Classic Vibes from Fender are using um, Indian Laurel, which I do have on that P-Base, and uh, it's, it's an unpleasant wood visually, and it's an unpleasant wood for your fingers to be on. I, I'm not a fan of, of, of Indian Laurel. I would rather have a good synthetic than, than that stuff. It, 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 it feels dusty and dry and corrugated, I, I guess is the best way to put it. It feels like I'm playing on fancy cardboard. I, I know that's unfair, and uh, you know, but it, it feels cheap. And at that same price point, others do. Oh, Jim Holloway, yeah, it's actually 1900 UTC. No, wait, is it? No, I don't think it is. UTC doesn't change with daylight savings. So through the summer, I thought it stayed the same. Um, I need, I'll need. i look that up, and I'll change it going forward. But uh, it's... Um, according to the computer when I set this, UTC, 1 o'clock here is 1800 UTC, Universal Time Code. Used to be Greenwich Mean Time. And that, the UTC does not change uh, for daylight savings, so I thought it stayed the same. But I'll, I'll, I'll research that. I'm trying to trying to get good at this, you know, and, and give a, a time that uh, um, people can relate to. I guess I shouldn't even have to put the time on the uh, on the video title because it'll be... Whatever time I set it to debut, it'll show up in your local time. I only have that on there pretty much so that when people go back and they say, "Oh, that was that 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 was that day's chat," whatever. The, at least I need to have the date on there. Maybe I'll leave the time format off going forward just to avoid confusion. Hey, Chris. Yeah, late December you get reunited with your amps, and yeah, Christian was was a great player, really nice kid. Um, I'm gonna have him back definitely. Um, Vinicius says, a day in the life. Kind of, sort of. I didn't know what I was going to play. Um, 
I, I was noodling and then I had to go uh, take care of some stuff in the kitchen. I came back and wasn't feeling like noodling and uh, I just started to play it and then I realized I started with the, with the cowboy G versus bar, which makes it harder to get to the B minor and not, not my best Beatles, not my best Beatle. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Yitzi. Hey, Josh. Hey, Dennis Flock, Matt Fields, Craig, Victor, Jim. I think I've got you already, uh, Victor. Mr. Spillify. <laughs> and here we go. We got a winner. Anus McMuffin. My God, I hope you're a Scotsman. Um, he's got a 69 Mar Laney Supergroup 100. Whew. Can I remove the two EL34s in the output stage to reduce its power? Or will it damage the output transformer? You can remove them, but you have to do two things. You need to make sure that the bias is still good for just two EL34s. And you've got to do... Um, I just splashed myself with Coke Zero on my glasses. Just a second. You got to do uh, uh, intentional impedance mismatch. If you're using an 8-ohm cab, you would connect your cab to the 16-ohm uh, jack. Or if you have a three position switch, use your eight ohm cab and move the switch to 16 ohms. If you have a four ohm cab, you would set the amp to eight. If you have a 16 ohm cab, you're just gonna have a mismatch. The tubes will probably be safe, but you do need to make sure the bias is still good because um, with the decreased current draw, the B plus will go up. Alan Harvey is in Stockholm with lots of snow and you are welcome to it all. Hey, Gringo, JDS. Hey, Dustin. Yeah, it has been a while. I'm glad you're here. And Matt Fields feels my pain. Compactrons, that's right. That's the name of the, the, the three triode tubes, are all over the place except the 6BK11, of course. Hey, Natas. Natas Satana says, hey, Lyle, what's the best way to split a signal to two amps for dual mono or stereo? I usually use a stereo guitar effects pedal like a Boss Chorus. You want a good quality buffer. Um, and that can be something in one of your existing pedals, depending on what you have. Or it could be a standalone buffer. Um, but you don't want to split a passive signal unless you're okay with everything getting um, a bit weak and dark and more susceptible to noise. So you want a high quality buffer, and that can be just be built into a pedal if you want. Uh, for a lot of people, the buffer built into a Boss Stereo Chorus will do the job just fine. Um, if, you're, if you are not doing stereo and you just want to run your signal to two amps at once, the, better, the first thing you should do is get a, an active um, um, ABY box, which will have a good quality buffer in it. Um, and then you, would have, you want to have the option to fl flip the polarity of one amp and to do a ground lift so you don't have any ground loops between the two amps. And if the speakers are wired backwards or they have different number of stages, you can keep what's coming out of both amps in phase with each other So you could, if you're using them both at the same time. And I would look at uh, Radial for, for one of those. Radial has a great line of, of ABY boxes. So does Laylee, but they cost an awful lot more, and I'm not convinced that you get any more other than they have really pretty foot switches. Good morning, Mr. Brad. Glad to see you up in Adam. I remember last time we did this, you were you were a bit uh, a bit under the everything. Hey, Joachim, what is my opinion on bedrock amps? I have had them on my uh, bench in the past, and I have no memory of this place. I don't recall much about them other than they were okay. Uh, they didn't make an impression. So I guess that's a positive, you know, it's like, oh my God, that piece of, but neither did it blow my socks off. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, the more amps I work on, the harder I am to impress. And again, I know that I, I'm a champion of the Vox AC 15 and, and 30 custom series. Those are staggeringly good amps for the price if, if they work for you musically. Um, you know, because it's one thing for me to say, yeah, that's 60 three AC 30 here. That's going to be killer. That 66, uh, Marshall's great. The 74 Marshall, the 68 Marshall I got here. Those are all going to be fantastic. Yeah. But those also have huge price tags. I mean, we have to be realistic. So when I can say, go get a, 
Princeton reissue, or Princeton reverb reissue, and spend two hundred dollars making it not fall apart ten years from then. Uh, go get an AC fifteen and start gigging with it from day one. I think that that's information that I would want to know if I were in your shoes watching Mister Mister Know It All here talk about anything that's start. You know, I feel so guilty sometimes having the microphone and and a captive audience. Like, if there were any other subject in the world, what would my opinion matter? I, I've just been uniquely able to try a lot of things and see what works and what does not. So I'm, I'm just really, honestly, coming from a perspective of sharing stuff I found rather than dispensing wisdom to the masses, you know. Marcus Neiman asks, what's the best way to solder multiple connections on a turret? He has a Serotone Express clone. He has, it gets noisy when he has the switch selected to the brightness setting. Well, we'll do this in two parts. Let's talk, talk about soldering multiple connections on a turret. You want to make sure that the turret is tinned but has no excess solder on it because you don't want blobs of solder. You want the turret and tinned and clean so it's ready to take solder. You want to have all the leads that are going to be attached uh, cleaned and hopefully pre-tinned. And you want to have as many things mechanically hooked around 270 degrees, so a U, not a full wrap, and without any slack so that it's all there and the solder is just going to uh, kind of meld everything together and keep oxygen from getting in between the wire of the resistor and the turret, the wire of the cap and the turret. Uh, so the, you want to make sure that all that is good, then the solder is just there. And the best way to approach that is you want just a fillet of solder, is what the military spec calls it, where the solder fills the gaps and gives a light coating over everything. But you can, if it's done perfectly, you can still see, oh, there's the, there's the lead from the resistor, there's the lead from the cap, and they're not crossing over each other. They're, you know, like that. And you also have to think about long-term maintenance. All right, say you've got a cathode connection. You've got a wire at one end going to the cathode of the tube, a wire at the other end going to ground. You've got a cathode resistor and a cathode capacitor. Well, you're probably never going to have to remove the, the wires. So you do the wires at the bottom level. It, and that can be from the bottom pointing up or it can be wrapped around the base of the turret. Uh, then you're less likely to ever need to replace that resistor than you would be to re replace the capacitor. So you put the resistor second in the stack and the capacitor on top, whether it's going wrapped around the turret leads or whether it's going down into the turret. That Because... Uh, if it's electrolytic capacitor, you're going to need to change that 10 years from now. The resistor may not ever need to change, but if you do, you know, it, it can be. And that wire probably will not have to be changed out if it's done properly the first time. As far as the uh, uh, serotone getting noisy when you have the switch setting to the brightness setting, uh, it could be uh, our, our friend, and it likely is our good old-fashioned friend, generic silver mica caps that just say SM. So see if you have a brown or orange chiclet, uh, silver mica cap in there. If it says C CDE or, or, or CDM or anything like that, you're fine. If it just says SM, that's probably the cause. But without having your amp here, I can't be more, more precise. Sonics Music 4, uh, sorry, sorry, Sonics, Sonics Music 5 or V. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. I'm glad to be able to help. He was drinking the Kool-Aid to buy cheaper new Marshalls, but now looking at Friedman's. Yeah, if, I'd look at Serotone over a current production Marshall, uh, unless you're looking under a thousand. Um, and then Friedman's a big jump up in quality, uh, but there's no no shame in getting a uh, a, uh, a a Serotone. Um, it it's amazing to me how much. Marshall uh, and to a smaller degree Fender take their customer base for granted these days. They just keep pumping out worse and worse stuff, but it still has the logo. Hey, Cell Zealot. Oh, yeah, he got a Princeton reverb reissue. He got it used with the Alessandro GA SC64. He's had it for a day. It sounds fantastic, and he blames me. Mwahahaha. Like I was saying earlier, just go get a Deluxe Reverb Reissue or a Princeton Reverb Reissue. 
do the reliability t tweaks, which I put in the videos where I, you can do it yourself or you can take it to a tech. I mean, I'm giving that information away. That's the only thing those amps need to sound really good. They sound really good, um, aside from the stock speakers, uh, if it's like a C12K or some of the Jensen Alnicos. But in your case, you got the uh, Alessandro, which is phenomenal. So I'm glad to have ruined your life, Cell Zealot. Travis McCartney says, on Android, you can swipe the chat from right to left and it brings up the, the live thing. Good. Yeah, and Matt Fields says, the radial bones, Twin City, and Headlight. I, lo I love that uh, by the time I've answered something, a lot of times they've already had answers. Chris Butler loves Brad Guitar's Garage, Brad's Guitar Garage channel, and I, I agree. I think Brad's... Brad's uh, uh, channel is great. It's a shame about Brad. And he, he says that he looked up the GA86 schematic while I was rambling. He says he's got says he got the heaters for those tubes in series on the cathode. All right. Well, like I like I postulated about the PV 12 volt DC supply, they're using DC he heaters, which is you know a very modern thing to do. So. If it, if it works, it works. And uh, Brad's looking at the schematic. If he comes back and says, hey, but watch out for this or that, take him seriously. Uh, Brad and Matt Fields and John Williamson. Uh, and if anyone else is really qualified, I don't mean to overlook you, but I, I know that if Brad answers it, a question for you or Matt Fields or, um, or John Williamson, it's just as valid an answer as I could give you. Oh, JDS, yeah. Wire strippers that don't mess up a, cop a copper core. Um, I bet Brad's going to have an answer for that. Um, but I imagine the, 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 the answer is going to be German and spend money. <laughs> I've got some, the ones I use, I get at Home Depot. About every six, six months I replace it because they begin to not work very well. I will say the trick is to make sure that they are tight that the two pieces of metal that shear actually line up perfectly. There's no slop. And what I'll often do myself, because I've not spent the money for a pre precision German one, is if I got 22 gauge like you're talking about, I will use the 20, I'll use the uh, 22 gauge to cut the insulation, but then I'll go to the 20 gauge to strip, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm cutting to, to the insulation size, but I'm stripping with the next hole. That sounds all kinds of wrong. Okay, yeah, all right. Uh, I tip your waitress, folks. But uh, yeah, that that's how I do it. And then when it's Teflon uh, jacket, I, I, I it involves extra cussing. Jamie Nice, I do not have any experience with an Elsinore. I don't know what an Elsinore is. In a car rambler, it's it's probably an eminence or similar that car just has uh, a label put on, but I don't know what speaker it is. And recommending an upgrade for a player uh, when I don't know what they sound like, what guitars they use, what they how they play, or what the speaker they ha currently have is, because what if the speaker I recommend is what's already in there or is comparable to what's already in there? As far as a weak reverb, must be tuned turned up to almost two o'clock to sound decent. Um, I think the Rambler is just using 12x7s for the reverb. It's been a long time since I had a Rambler in. Uh, you may just have a weak 12x7, or you may not be thrilled with the reverb circuit, or you could have uh, a weak tank. But um, uh, I, it's been over a year since I had a Rambler in, so I don't, I don't recall. But I will tell you that Steve Carr would know, and he would probably be glad to help you with that. He's a good guy. Hey, Emmett, thank you very much. He said, great capture of young guy. That was uh, Christian Ketterman uh, with his Victoria. He watched it three times. I feel that I've really uh, made large strides with the, with the video quality. And I think I got some really good results on that. But with the Royer mic that I got in and the new miking setup, I feel that my audio has just gone four by leaps and bounds um, as far as giving you guys an idea of what it really sounds like in the room. 
and I was thinking how odd it is that I finally have this great big uh, live, what it really sounds like, recording ability. Uh, and yet in a mix, a lot of times I think an engineer would say, well, the Royo sounds great, but it's got way too much low end for this. Just do that 57 and we're going to EQ the rest, you know, because there's what, what we want as players and there's what works well in the mix. And they're not always the same thing. But for the past several years, all I've been getting on the channel is the 57 very slotted thing. And now it's like, hey, we're in CinemaScope. And I'm thrilled because I, for what I'm doing for this purpose, I cannot do any better than just say, hey, this is what it sounds like. And, and that was pretty much exactly what it sounds like in the room. If you were to play it back at about 95 dB through really good studio monitors, that's what it sounded like in the room. If you're listening on your phone, yeah, it's an approximation. Hey, PF, I appreciate that, man. I'm I, that's why I put this stuff out there, you know. Uh, so you had broken solder joints on your super super reverb, and yeah, that five microfarad cap. If you look at the schematic, you won't know. You have to have had a whole bunch of the actual amps that they made from '64 to '69 to say, oh, they actually changed that, and that makes sense because with the 25 microfarad, you turn the speed knob too fast, the vibrato stop, the the vibrato stops, and then it catches up. Whereas if you have the 5 microfarad or 4.7 microfarad, you turn that knob real fast, the vibrato ch changes real fast. It's a small thing, but it's nice. <laughs> yeah, Yitzi says, don't be dumb like me and work on vintage amps to start. I've, I've been watching your Princeton, uh, <coughs> your Princeton Chronicles, and I did not mention the, the grid or screen wires to you because I'm a nice guy. And I figured you would learn more once you realized it yourself. Uh, nothing teaches us quite like our own stunning moments of dough. You know I say that with love, man. And if you get stumped, give me a call. Let's see. BYOC, build your own clone. That's what it was, yeah. Hey, Randy Steffs. Well, I, w I wish I could, uh, Vinicius, I wish I wish I could have you guys talk back to me so you, I could learn how to pronounce your name. But Portuguese was very tough. I, I, I absolutely loved my time in Lisbon, and I want to go back when I can. Um, but it was almost worse because I had studied Spanish in high school. So everything was just almost, almost right in my mouth, but then I'd fuck it all up. Um, and then by the time I was getting kind of good at it and like saying do instead of de uh, or de, you know, uh, then I was in Italy. And then I was in Italy um, and all my Italian has always been kind of transliteration from Spanish. And then my previous week in Portugal threw off my uh, Italian for a day. Basically, I sound like a, an, an idiot wherever, wherever I went because I'd studied Spanish Let's see. Hey, Clyde. I've never worked on a Guild or a Yamaha T1 or T50, I don't think. I think I might have had the Yamaha Saldano thing, but I've never had a Guild. Hey, Leo. Cool. Yeah, the, the runts are fantastic amps, and for a lot of stage use today, they're just perfect. I hope you love it. If not, talk to Dave. If you love it, give me the credit. If you don't like it, tell Dave. David S. asks, is transformer supply manufacturing still an issue in the industry these days? Yeah, not as, as horrible as it was two, three years ago. Um, but Mercury um, had a huge setback when Patrick died. Uh, and, you know, and COVID affected them like everyone else. Um, Haybor, well, let's talk about Classic Tone first. Classic Tone just went out. They just went away, which really sucked. And... Haybor pretty much got a lot of the orders that had been going to Classic Tone, which meant that they were suddenly out of stock on everything. Their entire business model changed, and they're still not fully stocked on everything. There's still some long delays. And um, 
Uh, Hammond also picked up a lot of that, and Hammond has been seemingly changing um, uh, who's making some of their parts. And I, I have not gotten to the bottom of it, and I don't want to put false information out there, but I've had some transformers from Hammond that uh, had the same model number as the old stuff, but the dimensions were entirely different. Not like fractions of a millimeter, but like two millimeters different than they used to be as kind of like where holes went and everything. So I don't know what's up with Hammond, and I'm keeping a cautious eye on that. But it is better than it was, but it's not great. Broken Home, always, always, always update the power cables. And if you just want to look at them and say, yep, they're original, we'll put them on the shelf and never plug them in because an ungrounded power cable is de potentially deadly. And even if it's not deadly, it's noisy as hell. But you can see videos of me testing apps with two old two-prong connectors where I got a 50-50 shot of whether I've got 110 volts live on the chassis or not. I show that in those videos. It's, it's, it's not like some namby-pamby, oh, they want us all to be so safe. We, we got to wear helmets when we ride our bikes, blah, blah, blah. No, this is, this is... Behind every good electrical code is someone who died unnecessarily. And so, don't let it be you. What's a typical sign of failing plate resistors? Well, uh, your gain's going to be off. You, know, you, you could have noise and white noise and hiss and buzz, or you could have arcing. Um, usually... Uh, if I have a bad resistor, it's going to be one of two things. And it can be a lot, of, it can be and has been a lot of things, but usually it's one of two things. Either a lot of rushing water noise, uh, spe specifically in a carbon comp, but sometimes in an old carbon film, or um, uh, it just won't have enough gain or won't have any gain. Sometimes it just won't. And that's easy because you measure voltage on the one side and the, hey, it's like 400 volts. The other side, there's nothing. On the other side, there's nothing. It's either the plate resistor or that's a cathode setup or there's no path to ground through the cathode. Some, sometimes it's a bad resistor. But when the app's off, you can measure the resistors. Sometimes, though, you'll get a res resistor that measures like 110K, and, and you think, okay, well, it's still close to spec. But under current, it cannot. It doesn't have that actual resistance. And you may have really weak gain, in which case it's lower or sometimes too much gain, but it, it's not the same gain at all frequencies. Um, I will say that unless it's a noisy old carbon comp, uh, it's n not always. It's rarely the plate resistor. I've seen a lot of apps come in where all the resistors were changed up to metal film, and I think just because of something someone read on a forum somewhere, there's probably nothing wrong with the old resistors. As you've discovered in your Princeton, DC on the board of an old Fender uh, produces a lot of the same problems or probably the exact problems that people traditionally have replaced uh, resistors with uh, metal films and caps with orange drops to, to, to fix. And but the heating of the eyelets on the old board to change out the old Ajax uh, uh, blue molded cap for an orange drop or to change out the old uh, carbon comp for a metal film, well, the heating up of that board drove DC out of that, and so they have the new component in there, and the problem seems to be gone. They think it was because they changed the component. No, it's just because they heated it up, as you have discovered yourself on that Princeton. Uh, I, I change parts on old fenders very reluctantly, and uh, you know sometimes I will have a, a noisy plate resistor. Sometimes I will have a, a noisy, um, very microphonic film cap, or a dead film cap in the LFO, and a lot of times in old fenders, the bright cap uh, is no longer the value it, it's rated, it, it says. Uh, like a 120 picofarad cap may measure like 40 picofarad. And I'm suspicious of the 470 picofarad or 500 picofarad bright cap in your AC30 for that same reason, because you were getting crazy lack of low end through that AC30 uh, brilliant channel, and you should not have that. So when I get this next video up on this 63 AC30. Listen to what it should sound like and then compare it to yours. And call me if you have any questions about that, man. Ooh, hey. Andy Kulikowski, 
Thank you very much. I'm glad to be helping people. Yeah, Kyle Bull, uh, Dan Brockman says, there's also Kyle Bull. I like, Dan, I like Kyle Bull. He's one of the few Kyles I, I can stand. Yeah, but he's very much into thrash metal. Um, I, I listen to him play, and it, it's, it's a different world. It is, in, is entirely different to my, my approach to electric guitar as, say, a classical guitarist is. But, I'm, hey, that's what's cool about this, this is that everyone, there's so many different ways that people can enjoy music. Uh, four, I do not have any opinion on rev amps. I'm going to try to reach out to them to get something in so I can have an opinion. I'd, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, revs are fantastic. But until I have one in, I cannot have any opinion on them other than they look cool. Um, and, uh, whenever I say things like this, someone always comments, well, if you haven't seen one, that probably means they're good because they're not failing. And that's possible. Uh, the other issue is that most new amps are under warranty and I'm, not I don't do warranty repairs because there's no money in it. So amps come to me after the two year warranty is up or whatever the warranty period is. The other thing is Rev is relatively a very small player, and there aren't that many of them out there in contrast to the Maces and Marshalls and Fenders and uh, Line Sixes of the world. But if they're great, maybe there will be. Oh, um, Paul, I don't, I don't know um, the particulars of the five F tanks. Sorry, uh, man. Old, 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 uh, old reverb tanks. Uh, there used to be so many different reverb tanks on the market than there are today, and it's hard for. I, if an app came in that needed that, I'd have to research it from the ground up. Sorry. Uh, contact someone much, much older than I am. Believe me, believe it or not, I'm not that old. I'm just gray. Hey Chris, yeah, the, the old classic twenty combos and classic thirties and 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 Delta Kings or Delta Blues, whatever they are, were all good amps for the price point. They had some fr fragile points, like the eighty uh, fours dangling down in the back, and the chassis not really being connected to the cabinet very well, and some heat issues. But really good sounding amps for the price. I mean, those things were designed to be about two hundred dollars to make. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. As I've said, as a cautionary tale, PV used some very oddly mounted uh, pots uh, with very, very s small plastic bushings and like three spider mounts to the board. And PV was the only person who, only company that really used those. And you could only get them from PV's parts department, and that parts department is pretty much gone or going away. So, you know. Hey, Alex. Thank you, Matt Johnson. I appreciate that. Let's see. Uh, we had a fantastic Thanksgiving, and we're, so I survived Thanksgiving. Now I'm gearing up for Christmas. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Do I have a preferred type of shielded wire I like to use in preamps of high gain circuits? Yeah, let's see. Where did that go? just had it. Where did it go? It was right here. <clears throat> well, I can't find it. My favorite, which I'm not able to get right now, but I'm looking for it. It's like RG174, and you'll have seen it in my videos. Oh, it's, it's in one of those boxes. Never mind. I'll get it later. It, it's, it's like RG-174, but with the 22-gauge center conductor stranded versus like a 26 or 28-gauge, which most coax is. And the stuff I have is, is uh, so tinned, stranded, 22-gauge, 
with a Teflon jacket. And over that is a is a really good metal braid, and then that's in another uh, uh, Teflon jacket. That stuff's great, but I can never remember the uh, the RG numbers. Not one seventy four. Uh, failing that, I like the Canari. I think it's called GS four, which is a small instrument cable that Canari obviously makes, and um, it's not much bigger than the really small uh, Mogami stuff, but it has a much better um, uh, uh, sh- much better shielding than the small diameter Mogami stuff. I do like the Mogami stuff for a lot of applications, uh, but it's not as great at, at shielding as the uh, Canari. And this is not like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. It's, it's a noticeable difference in a circuit. Hey, Dan Brockman, cheese head. Yeah, I just love it when I find things that, hey, that's called a cheese head screw. Okay. I also like to put those things, not in every video, but in the occasional video, just let me know who's watching the whole thing because I see these things and like, all right, it's a 20-minute video and the average length is, average watch time is eight minutes. I don't know whether half the people are watching it for 20 minutes and half people are watching five seconds and it evens out or whatever, but it's discouraging to, to, to spend all the time making the videos and to edit the videos and try to do them as best as I, as I possibly can and then have the average watch be a third or a half of, of the thing. So I got I to gotta tell myself, no, no, people are watching the whole thing. There's a real group of cool people out there and then there's people who clicked on it by accident while looking for funny cat videos. So excuse, excuse it, excuse it artificially low. And so things like cheese head or elephant cupcake, etc. Just let me feel reassured that people are out there watching and that it, it, in some small way this matters. Paul Johnson, I don't have the, the ensemble in front of me, so I don't know whether to tell you to reduce B plus or increase the cathode resistor. In general, you don't want to play around with reducing B plus because it, you get into all kinds of issue with heat. You're gonna you're gonna want to uh, 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 increase the value of the cathode resistor, but know that as you increase the the value of the cathode resistor, the bias will cool down, but the B plus will increase, and you need to know what your data sheet max is for your output tubes. You don't want to uh, solve one problem and cause another. And also, what is hot? Um, I, I don't know what tubes they use, but if it's 6V6s or EL84s, generally uh, you want to be about 115 to 120% max over the over the data sheet max. So it's nominally a 12-watt tube. If, if it's idling at 13 to 14 watts, you're fine. If it's 15 or higher, cool that cool that sucker down. Hey, uh, Beast Fu, he's an owner of a 74 JMP50. Is it opinion, in my opinion, is it worth upgrading these to higher voltage? Easy to do, sound better. I would not make a change in a 74 Marshall. If you have a 74 Marshall with uh, the, the lower B+, say 360 to 380, and you play another one which has a higher B+, and you prefer the sound of the one with the higher B+, sell your 74 to someone who wants the original, and buy a Marshall with a higher B plus because there are Marshalls of that era which have um, have uh, um, higher B plus. I would not change the original uh, transformers in an old Marshall due to almost a, a trend for you know it's, it's like if I go back to 1978 and all my guitars would suddenly need brass nuts. No, I don't think so. It is what it is. Love it or, or get something else. Uh, Rusty uh, Mohican, I have tried solid state tube replacements. Um, most of them are just diodes in a piece of plastic, and that's okay. Some of them will have dropping resistors, uh, but dropping resi- you know, uh, to introduce the, the sag uh, depends on whether it's done on the DC side or the AC side. It's much better to have it done on the AC side than on the DC side due to how resistors work with different uh, voltages. Then you get into heat issues. And um, I find like the Weber copper cap and other things 
kind of be be da- kind of to be dangerous because owners do that, and they like the sound difference because it is a difference, and they've spent money on it, so they're gonna like it, but they don't necessarily know what it's doing to the rest of the amp. Is, is it still biased correctly, et cetera, et cetera? It's it's changing one very made one major variable in an app without necessarily knowing what all the variables are that are affected by that. So. People are saying that it was 1900 UTC. Well, that's weird because it was 1800 when I set this up, one o'clock. Okay, yeah. All right, I I see where my mistake was. Anyway, I'm going to take the UTC, any time reference off this going forward. I'm just going to do the date and I'll let YouTube tell you what time it is. Sorry, I was trying to be inclusive to everyone and I, I, I got the. I got it wrong. Michael Davis uh, started to ask a question and right up against the, the, uh, the character of it. Um, hopefully he'll come back. Thanks, Dennis Flock. Appreciate that. Hey, I think the Neo Creamback sound really good. Um, I've only tried them once, but I tried tried it with like three different apps and um i i thought they sounded really good a little bit bright but they were it was a brand new speaker uh i have no complaints but i've only used them for about a week hey cursor cursurks welcome from the netherlands let's see Oh, cool, Chris! You got the the the, uh, the T three from John. Well, that worked out for, well for both of you. Hey, Des Vega, and thank you very much, Andy Kilikowski. Using standoff for board on five E three build. There's half inch from board to chassis. Better to run long leads down to chassis and up to tubes, or or shorter vest, even if it sacrificed a little shielding from the chassis. Uh, We're not talking about a huge length either way. Uh, I would run the wires down from the board. Let's see if the if the screen let me do. So if here's your board, go down to the chassis, run along the chassis, then up a little bit to the tube socket. Uh, it'll do. It'll give the t- uh, depends on what wires you're using uh, to a degree, but that little bit of shielding can be nice, and it keeps them far. It helps you keep the control of the lead dress. Um, but if you just want to go straight from the, from the board to the tube socket, you can, but I would not want to have a half inch length of wire because you would have no, um, no, uh, margin of error and no slack in that. So if I had a half inch distance between point A and point B that I needed to solder, I'd want an inch and a half of wire. So I'd have some slack. It's not a, you're not going to notice any difference between an inch and a half of wire versus a half inch of wire. Uh, we're not doing satellite, you know, sat nav stuff. Uh, it'll be fine. Make it so that you can you can work on it without everything being taught. Thank you, Daniel Helderman. Uh, yeah, old MiG fifties, uh, Softec MiG fifties. They were just really inexpensive um, Marshall clones made with uh, surplus Soviet military stuff. Uh, the magic was not in the the uh, Soviet military stuff. The magic was that uh, 1987 is a good sounding circuit, and you could get them back then for like 600 bucks. So if if you love the old MIG, you can look and see what MXR is making today or Softec is making today. I don't remember which which brand it has the, today. The reissue of it, but all that is is a reissue of, of a copy. So it's a copy of a copy of a Marshall. Uh, Old Marshalls are the sound that you loved. And if you want that sound today, I would probably point you towards either Serotone at a, at a lower price point or definitely Friedman. Hey, Mark, well, the, you just got in touch with me, so that's good. Send me an, an email at info, I-N-F-O, at si- psionicaudio.com. 
and I will get to you, but I um I, I gotta I, I'm drowning in emails and it's just the one guy, so I don't I don't see every one of them, sorry. But I will try. Michael Davis uh, answered a question about learning app maintenance at the beginning of the chat. So you, you can go back and catch the, the replay and get a better answer there. Uh, Brendan Gauntner, Alamos are terrible, terrible apps. Uh, I would avoid all Alamos, sorry. Mended Cheese wants a video on noise and apps. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I've done that to a degree. In, in apps, the thing is to demonstrate that really well, I'd have to have a noisy amp. Um, and when I have a noisy amp, it's usually because I have an amp in for a pair. I'm talking about that amp in general rather than making it uh, specific. Hey, and this is a great example of one common cause of noise in an amp. Uh, and I can't wait till I have like 10 noisy amps for that all have different causes before I could really show you. So it'd be a lot of theoretical. I'll consider it. I, I I see the value in having a video like that out there, but I don't know that I could uh, teach it if I didn't have that problem to show you. I mean, if you if you go back and watch the 900 videos I already have up, you come away from that process uh, really sick of the sound of my voice and really glad that I got good microphones at some point. But you'd also know like. 37 different ways to diagnose noise in apps. Uh, hey, Alex, I'm glad I, I was you. Oh, so I'm not catching you early. Alex, I'm catching you late. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, and uh, it's time for Alex to go to bed because we're going to take a first uh, intermission. So we're going to take a seven-minute break and everyone stretch your legs, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to re-educate myself on how the universal time code works. Uh, uh I don't know how I got that messed up because all summer long it was 1800. So I figured, well, they're not doing daylight savings. It would still be 1800. Obviously, I was wrong somehow. Anyway, see you guys back in seven minutes.
All right, coming back out of uh, intermission, Des Vegas is asking about his DSL 40C and DSL 100H. Uh, the fixed value uh, tone stack in there, and then the later you get the full three band with knobs. It's a fixed tone stack, just do tone shaping. Uh, it just locks in a certain sound, then you manipulate it later. It's just a matter of where gain stages happen and how, how to, to make a gain stage speak in a certain way. Let's see here. And a rare instance of Brad and I both being positive. Radial does really good stuff, and we don't say that lightly because uh, we're always expecting people to take shortcuts and, and just sell crap, but radial does not. Let's see. Scrolling down. Jonathan Farmer, um, I, I, I cannot speculate as to the future of tubes and tube pricing and availability, but uh, I uh, hope for the hope for the best, plan for the worst. You know, um, we shall see. Uh, probably at the time that they become a big problem, I'm going to be concerned with you know. Who's going to give me my sponge bath? So I only got about another 25 years to worry about this. Because you young guys, you know. Let's see. AC15 versus Deluxe Reverb, Fred, Fred Ricci says. Uh, it's, that's, not, that's not the question. The goal is to have both. They do different things. And uh, you can play, play them. And if you play them... Uh, you're going to say, oh, that's the one I would want for this, and that's the one I want for that, and here's where they overlap. Let's see. Yeah, uh, I would, I, I'm not a fan of morally anything. Um, <laughs> the fuzz box asks, would I ever consider going into a GK250 ML? Well, as a huge fan of Life's and, and Gilmore, uh, yeah, I would absolutely. I already asked me to, to fix if I'd fix one or if I'd play one, and the answer is yes to both. I'd love to have uh, a mint condition at 250K, 250ml or the larger rack one that Lifeson had. Uh, Leon Todd had one on his channel not long ago, and he got some sounds that I instantly said, that's, that's that sound. But yeah, bo both for um, the uh, uh, marathon kind of stuff, Mid '80s rush, and for things like um, sorrow, that's the sound of that of that amp. Let's see. Oh, big boss! Uh, I have a lead 100 here. It belongs to Chris Nola Rocks here in the chat. He's picking it up in a couple weeks. Uh, it didn't seem to be that noisy to me, um, so I didn't need to redo anything. But ground schemes are ground schemes, solid state or tube. They work much the same. Um, but I did not find any problems with with a, a noise floor in the in the lead 100. So I didn't investigate any changes. So. Let's see. Hey, Arthur Veldoin. Uh, my thoughts on old Roland JC amps, jazz chorus amps. They were phenomenal in 1978. They were great up to about 1985. They were world-changing, game-changing, top of the class. That was a long time ago. Um, it's 2023. It is a single-trick pony. It is noisy. It is heavy. It is expensive. It has one sound, it has no headroom, and has one of the worst distortions of all time. And it uh, has very little control of the chorus effect. And if you were to play uh, that next to a 100-watt katana, the katana does that exact same sound, and you have control over the chorus, and you have more headroom, 
and it's not noisy, and it weighs less, and then you've got about 99 other sounds, and the katana costs a third of what the jazz chorus uh, costs. So I don't see any point to the jazz chorus anymore, and I, I, I declined to service them because they cost so much to repair, and they're like seven different revisions, and they, and they all do different things uh, without any great documentation of what the changes are. Uh, and they're built like boss pedals, like old boss pedals. It's just it's like buying eight boss pedals together. Uh, it's nothing wrong for a pedal, uh, but it's. I think the time has passed. Let's see. VS asks, is there a way to brighten the reverb on a 70s deluxe reverb? Uh, it could be the tank. Uh, it could also be, um, uh, there's a 22 uh, nanofarad, or sorry, 2200 nanof, sorry, 2200 picofarad, 2.2 nanofarad cap to ground off the uh, reverb return jack on that amp. You could lift one into that, see if that brightens it up for you. You could also have a problem with the uh, uh, capacitor off the plate of V4A, which then sends a signal to the reverb pot on the front. And if that is um, too large and has drifted larger than the 3.3 nanofarad, 3300 picofarad, uh, then you would be getting more lows and it would give you the apparent uh, uh, lack of high end. Um, so those are places to look. Without having your amp in front of me, I cannot tell you. Uh, more precisely. Let's see. All right, Jonathan Farmer, I'm not trying to be mean, and this goes to everyone. If you ask a question, please ask it once. As you can see, Jonathan Farmer asked the same question twice. I answered it the first time I saw it, and now I've seen it again. It may be farther down the chat. Multiple versions of the same question just make it harder for me to get to everyone's question, so. Let's see. Uh, TRS, Mike, I don't have any experience with what Mark Bartell is doing now as far as having one in front of me or playing it. I have had uh, some of the Bartell era Tone Kings in, which were very well built and sounded great. And I've seen pictures of what Mark is doing today. And uh, based on what I'm seeing, they should be phenomenal. But that is uh, uh, purely theoretical. However, it's theory, you know, it's that, that theory is based on a lot of experience. I think Mark does great work, um, but I've, I've not had one in, in front of me. Brad says, I've got to get one of those Royers, but ban myself from spending any more money this year. Well, the good news there, Brad, is that there's only a few more days left of this year, and soon it'll be next year, and you can spend money again. It'll be great. Let's see. Jim Holloway says he just did my mods on his AC30 CC2. Big improvement. I'm glad. Yeah, uh, it, it, They're good amps. They were just a little bit handicapped as they left the factory. I'm glad I was able to help you there. Hey, Ken Bailey. Uh, f uh, Fred Federici says, is an adjustable negative feedback pod a good idea for the blackface amps? I think it's an overblown mod. Most people are going to find one thing that they like, and a lot of times what they're going to like is going to be the, the negative feedback. I did a huge negative feedback change on a deluxe reverb for a client the other day. I changed it from 820 ohms to 1.5K. Uh, gave them a little less negative feedback. But if it, if it was more than that, if it was no negative feedback, then the bass was flubby. Uh, this gave a little more gain um, 
without a noise increase, but the bass stayed tight. Um, there are so many variables. Uh, I find that the mid spot is, if you're going to have an adjustable anything, don't mess with the, the negative feedback. Don't, don't mess with lifting the tremolo out of the circuit, any of that stuff you see. Uh, a variable mid spot is the way to go. And I use a 100K audio taper. So from uh, 7 o'clock to noon, you have the range of a twin reverb mid pot. And from noon to 5 o'clock, you get more and more gain. It starts with more mids and more gain. And eventually, you know, the tone stack is pretty much bypassed. That is the, the one thing that all Fender Blackface amps uh, will, can benefit from and most owners would like. Even if you never use the full range, even if you just say, all right, 10 o'clock is the deluxe reverb and just below 9 o'clock is, is what I like out of a twin and I can make my deluxe reverb sound like a deluxe reverb or I can make my deluxe reverb sound like a 22-watt twin. And if you do that, you may just want to put in a 10K audio taper pot and never have uh, the additional gain uh, range, but just have a little more fine control over the, over the, the uh, subtle stuff. Hey, Robbie, uh, Yvonne, I'd, I have no experience with the Laurel Canyon from Matchless. Um, I would not s s ever specify changing tubes on a specific schedule to anyone unless they are ab about to embark on a world tour, um, in which case they would have a guy like me or Dave Freeman there. Hey, Dave, uh, uh, go through everything before they embark on said road, uh, uh, world tour and they would have a tech on the road with them. But you know, if if you if your Laurel Canyon sounds great, that's fantastic, and you change the tubes if and when you begin to have a problem with them, not because it's June or whatever. Hey, Richard Clark, uh, I don't know whether I would use the Twin City or the Big Shot from Radial. Because I would have to look up all all the all the specs on them. Um, what I would look for in a in an ABY switcher, specifically since you asked about s splitting in stereos, I would I would I would look for I would want it to be buffered, so a good quiet, buffered active uh, splitter. I want to have the options for ABY. I'd want to be able to lift the ground, and I'd want to be able to uh, flip the polarity. On one of the outputs, so whichever of those two radials fits that uh, role, that's the one to go for. And if they both do, then if one's yellow and one's blue, get the blue one. Hey, thanks, JDS. I appreciate that. I will be doing an amp tech workshop tour video coming up. I've got a little bit more straightening up to do, so there's a little less clutter um, in the parts where you just don't see all the time. I just want to make sure it's ready for, for prime time. But yeah, I've been thinking about doing that. I've got a lot of stuff here that you guys don't see or that you've only had hints of in the background of certain videos. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, uh, as far as the tools, products, materials I use on a daily basis, I've started putting a lot of that stuff in the descriptions of all the videos for the past couple of weeks. There's a big long list down at the bottom of the description uh, answering things that people ask about a lot. Um, so look there, and if you have any more specific things, uh, let me know. But yeah, I'm going to do a, a tour of the shop, so to speak. The shop, it, it's, it's, it's a room in our house, but it's, it's a very well-equipped room. I don't have any hot take on the new Gibson uh, boogies because I have not, I have not had one in, and until I do, I will have no opinion. Hey, Bit Matt, I have no experience with Amplified Nation other than watching. Uh, the guy from Amplified Nation be interviewed by Keith Williams on Five Watt World about a month ago. So that's that's my knowledge, and he seems like a nice guy. We 
Let's see. Oh, Pacific Audio is open up to the general public now? That's good. I need to look into that. They were always kind of an OEM avenue. So I, I had not been doing, I hadn't really looked into them. I need to look, I know that they do really good stuff. Apparently the Sony lost focus at some point. It must not have been very long. All right, uh, Dragutin Jakovjevic. If I misspell, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. It's it's. Um, I'm reading this stuff here, and it's about twelve point. I can make it larger, but then I don't. I feel like an old man. So, but it takes me a while to sort through things. I, I need new glasses. What speakers would I recommend to replace an extremely efficient and loud pair of WGS T twelve C slash S's in a six V six stereo amp based on Magnetone Twilighter? Thanks a lot. Um, I I like those speakers. I think the G twelve C and C S sound fantastic, and um, I've heard the, uh, Magnetones with that speaker, and they sounded really good. So I don't know that I would recommend a different speaker uh, unless you just want a different take on good, in which case maybe some Creamback 65s would be good, which are going to give you, or the ET65, which will give you a little less mid-scoop, a little less sparkle, but without being dark or without being nasal. Um, or maybe you might prefer to have a pair of Alnico speakers, in which case maybe some Celestian Blues or WGS Black and Blues would be cool to give a little more compression and a little more of... Uh, of uh, that thing that a, fifth, uh, a Celestian Blue does. But I think the G12CSs are fantastic. Did I leave that please click like up for forever? I thought that was going to, I thought, I'm sorry, I meant to only leave that up there for about 30 seconds and I got distracted. It's supposed to be this little thing that mysteriously comes in and out from time to time and says different things, and then I forget to do it, or in this case, I forget to turn it off, so it, it kind of ruins the uh, the effect. I just don't want to have it be one of those guys who's always begging you for money and, and likes and clicks and smash that blah, 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 and telling you how YouTube works. Uh, I'm also, unless you run a channel, you don't know the pressure we are under now to subject you guys to ads constantly. Uh, YouTube is changing the way ads work and they want me to do mid-roll ads all the time. And like, I have the choice now, every five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 30 minutes. And as you might have noticed, aside from the ad at the beginning before the, when this started, and there might be one at the end, there are no more ads in the middle. So think of all the revenue I'm not making because I hate those things, and I don't want to subject you to them, but they're really trying hard to to make it harder for me not to give you ads all the time. So, uh, let's see. Hey, John Cant uh, McC McCantrell. He's got a double deluxe Victoria. He replaced the preamp tubes. Um, I've, if, if, you, if your Tungsol 12AY7 is 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 microphonic change it if it's not microphonic don't worry about it um there are still a lot of new old stock joint army navy 12 ays and 12 ats out there uh for 30 to 40 bucks at tube depot and other good vendors that's what i would look at but if the tongue saw 12 a y7 is sounding good and it's not microphonic for you now it may be good for a long time Especially in a double deluxe, that's not a particularly hostile environment for a tube. But yeah, long 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 plate tubes can be more prone to microphonics than short plate. Emilio, um, I don't have any thoughts regarding interleave versus non-interleaved output transformers. I have thoughts as to which transformer companies 
uh, I've enjoyed the sounds of, and how they how they achieve those sounds remain to some degree a mystery to me. I've got a, a friend, Joe Pampel, who used to own obsolete electronics, and he knows a lot more about that than I do. But every time he explains to me what goes on, my eyes kind of roll up in the back of my head, and I, I fall asleep. Um, Dave and Brad uh, might know more than I do, and, and I know a serious amplification here. Uh, Alex, there in Australia, who builds transformers, is the guy to ask about that. And uh, I would take uh, Alex's opinion on that much more seriously than anything I would ever say. I can tell you if they sound good. I can tell you if they, if they last. I can tell you if, if they hold up. And, you know, but I can't, I'm not qualified to say, oh, he didn't interleave it that way. He didn't use this event. You know, they all, it's, it's, I don't know. I know what I know. And the rest of the stuff I look up or I call guys like Alex. Base Fox 11 fourth. Yes, amps should go in for regular service even if there's no trouble based on age. 60-year-old amps. Yeah, you should get them all looked at. Um, head, head trouble off at the pass. And uh, they, then they should be used fairly regularly. If The longer they sit unused, the, the more likely they are to have problems. But yeah, uh, you need to protect your investment and keep them going for the next guy. Um, A good tech with whom you have a relationship won't charge a ton to go through them and see if they need service and won't invent service just to get money off you. If you were to bring me five old fenders just to evaluate, I would evaluate them. I might say, hey, these three are, don't need anything. This one, uh, that's got a bulging electric lytic cap. This one, we need to put in a grounded power cable. Uh, and uh, it's got some DC on the board. You know that might be what what I tell you back. I don't know, or may need to have the the pots cleaned or the jacks tightened. But better to know that than than to think they're going to be fine, and then all of a sudden it catches on fire because that electrolytic that was about to go out went out, and a tech would have seen that in a heartbeat and say, "Whoa, don't apply power to this until we change this." I don't know anything about Quilter Mach 3 aviators, Ken Bailey. Sorry. I hope that they, uh, I hope, uh, that they last forever, but I have no idea. Hey, Chris Quinn. I'm glad you're getting a top hat. Uh, King <laughs> T35 pre King Royal, King Royal. That's that's a complicated complicated concept, but Brian makes good amps, and uh, I, I've been impressed by what I've seen inside there. And if it does uh, the sound, it does the sound. The fuzz box already answered the uh, GK two fifty ML. I've not been inside one because I don't know anyone who still uses one, but I, I'd love to. I've not been inside a Garnet amp, uh, Randy Steps. I know of them. Let's see. Snow pants. Let's see. Uh Nomi Talap. I'm I'm not a big fan of the DSL twenty. Um, I think the DSL forty is really good. The twenty is not so much, not specifically in the in the five is is kind of um, not hot garbage, lukewarm garbage. Um, Stone Roses, Cindy, and some metal. DSL 40 head will probably do fine for you. I just don't think it's as good an amp as a 40. Um, of course, if you have a digital modeler, you may not need to get an amp head. You can just get a power section, a powered cab, and run the modeler into that. Depending on what uh, modeler you have and how it's set up, you know, if, if, if I needed to gig these days and I mean, I, 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 I do this, I'm 63 Vox, 66 Marshall, 68 Marshalls, 74 Marshall, 72 Fender in the other room. I've got a 66 Super Reverb here. But if I needed a gig tomorrow on a small stage, if I had like an HG stomp, I'd have my presets, I'd have my sounds, 
And I could take that and, um, you know, say a, uh, I go pick up a, a, what do you call it? Even said it earlier, the um, katana. I could bring a katana and just plug in the effects return and have a 100 watt power section with with a 2 by 12 on stage and the sound would be coming out, all coming out of the modeler. And I'd be fine with that. Um, it wouldn't sound as good as what the rig I could make out of all these real amps here, but just for a, a pickup sitting situation, it'd be fine. Or maybe I could sculpt my entire musical identity out of that stuff. You know, it, you don't have to have the 66 Marshall to make music. You have to have music in your brain to make music. And whatever the tool that lets you do that is great. So um, I think a Katana would probably be better than the DSL-20. Um, I don't know that the DSL-20 head would be an upgrade from any modern digital modeler, but that's very subjective. Thanks, Rob F. Hey, Sergeant Grinch. I have watched uh, Vox Pop, um, th that documentary. I also have the, the big Vox book in the other room that's, that a client gifted me, which is nice because it's like a $100 book. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Jennings and, and, and Dick Denny and the AC-30, it's almost like it was great by accident. Um, I don't know how much credit they can really take. They made a very strange amp, which is a strange copy in some ways of a basement and a strange copy in other ways of a Gibson. And um, it sounded really good. And then, you know, um, Hank Marvin said it needs to be louder, so they made it louder. And then the luckiest thing in the world happened. Uh, they, they sold them, a couple of them to the Beatles. And then Ed Sullivan happened. And they blew up. And they got too big, too fast. Uh, and then they blew apart. Um, so, you know, JMI did not last that long. Um, and a lot of the amps that they made, you know, like the first AC-50 was only in production for like three or four months, and they went to the different version of AC-50, then they rushed out the AC-100, and then they went into bizarre solid-state things with fuzzes built in and hybrids, and they're trying all kinds of things, and they fizzled out. Um, but um, some of their accidents are still wonderful, wonderful things, but I'm not sure how much credit... Um, the designer should actually get. I think it's accidental, but they will, I will say that uh, their workforce of women who probably all had learned how to do RAF wiring looms during World War II, the, uh, the women who actually built the boards and did all the wiring did fant fantastic, if a bit um, weird work. Hey, uh, uh, Raf Freitas, uh, thank you for that. In a 65 Deluxe Reverb reissue, is it possible to hand wire the pots and input jacks directly to the PCB, bypassing the ribbon cable? It is possible. It is not advisable. You won't get any benefit from it. Uh, there are components that are on the board which hold the pots that you would have to have in the app, and then there would not be an easy way to hold them, and there would not be space to do them very easily. Um, Unless you're going to replace the entire main board with a new board, and I have done that, doing it piecemeal, just replacing the pots board and putting in uh, discrete pots won't buy you any, any benefit. Uh, the only problem with the existing one I've, sh I've shown is that the trace from the uh, vibrato channel volume pot wiper to V2B uh, is not routed very well, so you just cut that trace and remove that green wire going to V2B uh, as grid, and just run a shielded wire there, and that takes the problem, up, you know, all the problems out. It, it, if if that board has clean pots and they're all tight to the chassis, you're not going to have any problems. There's no need to to change all that stuff out. Hey, David Cla uh, Cadillac, 
Thank you very much for being here. Trainers are fantastic, as I've mentioned, especially the, like the the uh, the um, uh, bass masters. I would say that trainers have uh, the things to watch out for in a trainer, or the things to watch out for a lot of old amps. For instance, the um, uh, electrolytics. You don't want dried out leaking electrolytics. Trainers have two additional wrinkles. They have some strange Canadian uh, uh, safety regulations where you'll, you'll have fusible long wires sometimes, just very strange looking wires and, and additional uh, fuses that you don't really need. And that can be an added level of complication. Uh, and they also often, ha they usually have a circuit breaker. And that circuit breaker is a five amp circuit breaker and fails. And five amps is often overkill for the amp itself. I usually replace the circuit breaker with a, a dedicated fuse holder of the, uh, of the value necessary for the actual circuit. Um, and, uh, and sometimes there's a weirdness with the ground switch and the power uh, ground switch in, that, in the trainer circuit. And um, if you're going to work on it yourself, beware of the ground scheme because trainers sometimes have floating grounds and you can't uh, fix it the way you're used to fixing a fender. you got to see what they actually did and replicate that. No, man, time is a flat circle. Mr. Buttons, thank you very much. She's got a bad cat mini cat. I do not have any experience with those. Sorry. Um, hey, if if it, you know, this, if you got a one by twin six watt and you like the sound, you've won. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that, and I hope it's fantastic. I've had bad cats in that I thought were pretty good. I've had bad bad cats in that I thought were abominations. I hope that yours is one of the really good ones. So we're, everyone's making fun of my uh, getting uh, the uh, UTC wrong. Hey, Hanno Wirth, thank you for, uh, Wirth, sorry. Hanno Wirth, thank you for joining us. Danke. Uh, I've only had one Jim Kelly amp in, Hanno. It was very, very good and very, very heavy. Um, had a busted reverb pot. The reverb pot was on the rear panel, and it was on a little PCB. And uh, it was a bit complicated to remove the, uh, the rear PCBs to change that one pot. And so when I changed it out, I put in a, a, a pot mounted to the chassis with wires going from there to the PCB. So if it happened again... The next tech could change it in five minutes. Beyond that, the amp had no issues whatsoever. I'm sorry, no, that wasn't a, a Jim Kelly amp. That was a Coke amp, a Cock, 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 Coke, Kirk. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the problem was with the Jim Kelly amp. It reminded, the Cock reminded me of that. Um, it was a good amp. It was just very, very heavy, the Jim Kelly. Thank you, Greg D. Appreciate that. He's got the uh, AC fifteen C one. Yeah. Well, I don't need to trust random text. Trust the specific text. Uh, I, I will be taking in uh, work soon, and I might be open to doing your your AC fifteen C one in January, or February. Um, if, if 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 Dave Friedman is still here in the chat, ask him who to recommend in North California. He might know some really good guys. Um, I don't know everyone everywhere. Uh, and Dave's going to know all the LA and uh, surrounding area guys to recommend. Chris Butler, um, I think it's, uh, you just want surgical tubing f f uh, for pickup stuff. You can probably get that tubing, uh, just the long length of it, Stu Mac, or on Reverb or eBay. Uh, I'm not sure what the dimensions are. Brad will know if, he, if, he's, if he'll answer you. Let's see here. Uh, 
Let's see. All right. Emmett Otter says he's got a follow-up on miking for these videos. He's having trouble miking his AC-15C1 with just a 57. Sounds great in the room, but fizzy or harsh high-end in mix. Need to do more experimenting. All right. Um, pretend that this SM57 is an SM57, okay? It is beneath the foam cover, which I can't take off easily. Pretend that this is the dust cap of a speaker. Let's see if I can do this so you can... All right, so here's the SM57. And here's the dust cap of the speaker. That's going to be painful. You move the SM57 just so it's pointed right where the dust cap meets the cone, or a little bit past that. So not, not right where the dust cap meets the cone, but just past that. That's going to be very balanced. If, this, if it's out here, it's going to be not as interesting. So that's pretty much what you want. 57 aimed at the edge of the dust cap and the cone, not the center of the dust cap. And that's what you will have heard in all the videos I have on the, my channel up to about a week and a half ago when I started using the Royer as well. And that can be that close to the grill cloth up to you know a hand's width away from the grill cloth it's a pretty good starting range. Somewhere in there from a hand's width away from the grill cloth to just barely away from touching the grill cloth. And if you can't see where the dust cap is because of the grill cloth, get a little mag light or your cell phone light and you'll be able to see what you're doing much better. And that's how I would suggest doing it. And you can do angles with the 57, but I would start off just straight at the amp perpendicular to, to the grill cloth, just as I showed in relation to the dust cap. And that should give you the results that I was getting the past several years that you've heard in all the AC-15 videos here. Look at uh, Tone Hang with Steve. That's that same fit, kind of 57 placement on an AC-15C1 with a greenback. And a not very spectacular sounding room. And I'm going into a Motu M2, and I'm um, recording... I record it so that it peaks at negative six dB on my on the mic pre, and then in post I'll level adjust them, I'll level match them, so the peaks are at negative one, and then I don't do any other processing in the videos. There's no EQ, no compression, no, nothing at, at all, except in occasional places where I'll, I will add reverb in post, and I will tell you that I've added reverb in post, and that's all I do on those videos, and that's the sound that you you can hear. So hopefully that helps. Let's see. Dustin Thiessen's just said exactly what I said. Hey, Sergio. Well, one manufacturer reached out to me and they sent me an app. And I, I, I tried to give some professional courtesy and say, hey, I found a couple of things about this amp that are problematic. And they, they wanted the amp back so they could make those changes and then send it back to me before I did uh, uh, anything on the channel. And I thought that was fair because I wasn't getting anything. I wasn't being paid or anything. I sent it back to them and I've not heard anything back. So I don't know what's up with that. I, I'm, I'm hoping the other uh, uh, manufacturers take the, take the plunge. Dave, if he's still here, his amps did fine. John Sir's amps did fine. Swart did fine. Uh, uh, Brian with Top Hat did fine. It's, it's not like I'm in, s aiming to shit on amps. If something's good, I want, I'd want i love to know about it and tell people that it's, that it's uh, good. Rob F., I've not heard of Luke from Chesapeake Guitar and Amp Repair, but Brad might have. Yeah, well, Brad, it's, it's very disappointing. It's very disappointing that you pointed out that the Emperor was naked. Uh, he, he's referring to the 
Achilles Amp, which is a, a, a Australian copier offender who who gets the recipe wrong, and um, Lazy J, who should be out of business. They make the world's worst, most despicable, inexcusable, bullshit 5e3 clone for way a ton of money and absolute uh, no knowledge of how transformers or, or tubes work or how to build things. And uh, he said, hey, this thing uh, burnt its power transformer because of predictable reasons. And so he's been getting crap from the Australian distributor. Um, if you ever need a witness, man. <laughs> Lazy J. Suck my... Anyway, uh, do 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 I, I see I, I take a break and then everyone starts talking to each other and then I miss I, it's hard for me to catch up ooh uh, Gerald Ebmer asks regarding high gain designs what are good practices and bad practices I've encountered so far well that could be a three hour discussion um, I would say that uh, look at um, my evaluation of the Sir Ombre and uh, I mentioned some things in that video specifically, though that's not a high gain amp. Uh, John's circuit board in there gives some real great examples of things which are, are great ideas, which can uh, can be used to make a high gain amp real stable. Uh, I've, I've got some reviews of, of the Freeman stuff on here, and I did a, a, a interview with um, I was on Headfirst Amplifications interview uh, interviewed on Headfirst Amplifications page about a month and a half ago uh and i was we addressed this kind of question at length uh tricks you can do to to do these things so i think i can i've already given a longer answer in that format than i can give here but head first amplification every thursday night he interviews someone else in the industry and about a month and a half ago he interviewed me and we got into um, a lot of higher gain Marshall design concepts. So I hope that help you, hope you, that leads you to the answers. But also the, the Sir Ombre video I have up shows a lot of the things that work well in that app that would also are things that I like to do as good practices in a higher gain app. Well, yeah, Eric, the negative to a 16 ohm speaker is that most deluxe reverbs have an 8 ohm tap. But if you have a if you have a deluxe reverb that has an, an a 16 ohm tap, use a 16 ohm speaker. Um <sighs> Jim Cox is asking about best cloth insulated solid core wire. When I do a when I do a fender restoration, the wire I use I get from um, HoffmanAmps.com. I've heard that the uh, wire that that Mojo Tone has is also very good, though I've not tried it yet. Uh, I can say that the cloth covered wire that CE Distribution sells that's TubesandMore.com to, to those of you who aren't doing this pro uh, is not what you want because it's very thick and it's cloth over a PVC jacket, which is Defeats the purpose on multiple levels. But HoffmanApps.com and Mojotone.com both sell cloth insulated uh, solid core wire 22 gauge in all the correct colors. Uh, and I like the stuff that Hoffman has. For all I know, it's the same stuff because you know, neither Hoffman nor Mojotone are making that. They probably they may have the same supplier, but uh, that's that's the way I would I would go. Uh, PVC is fine in a basement, but if you're restoring a 60s fender and you want it all to match, cloth is the way to go. Thanks, BHM1712. Appreciate that. Hey, Matt's Guitar Corner. It is safe to run a, power, a, a tube amp without power tubes, providing that the uh, filter caps are rated to, to handle the unloaded B+. Plus. So if you have 500 volt caps and the unloaded B-plus is 550, be careful. You don't want to run very long that way. If the 
unloaded B plus is five, 600 don't run at all like that. Um, but it, uh, you, you, the output transformer will not need an, a load if you have no power tubes because the output transformer is, is not connected to anything if the tubes aren't uh, aren't doing anything. I mean, it's connected, but it doesn't have a path to ground if the output tubes are there. So there's no current through the transformer at that point. Um, so the only the only time you need to have a load on the output transformer is if the tubes are, are there. Uh, so hope, hopefully that, that helps. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, it's very rare for me to have an app where the B plus exceeds, uh, the capacitor rating. So I cannot test it without tubes. Let's see. Hey, withered hand electronic audio effects. Appreciate that. I like the pithy, pithy short name you got there too. Withered hand electronic audio effects. Uh, what are my thoughts on ribbon cables being used in high volt, voltage circuits? Any advice on implementation of PCBs or circuits in general? Well, it it depends on um, what the connectors are. You know the um, uh, the. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the good brand, 3M. 3M connectors are really good. Um, some of the gener generic stuff is really crappy. Uh, the issue is what is the insulative, the insula insulation properties and rating of all the things. What is the current handling? You know, you don't want to do like a a P5150 and have the heaters to the 6L6s going on 22 gauge uh, ribbon cables because then things burn in short as they do. Uh, I think that is probably much more possible to do excellent work using them than people tend to, because people tend to say, oh, and therefore we can save money by doing this, and we could save even more money if we'd use this one instead, and it becomes a race to the bottom. So if the goal is to have uh, really good connections while keeping the the build economical, then you can choose ribbon connectors or other multi-pin connectors with no sacrifice in quality whatsoever. But the temptation is there at the same time to then lower cost further. I think that's a slippery slope. At least it is as most manufacturers have implemented it. But whether it's two physical wires or two traces on a board or a ribbon cable or other Molex multi-cable connector, you're still looking, what is the voltage? What is the current? What are the heat issues? What is the insulation capable of? How much space do I need between these things? It's, it's The answer is always the same. The physics are the physics, the electrons are the electrons. And you can, you can do it hand-wired, you can do it PCB, you can do it ribbon cable. If you if you if it's the same person making the decisions each time with the same control over what components are are, are, are used, then you can get the same results. It's it's when a um, an accountant steps in and says, ah, but we can save three cents per unit by doing this thing that'll catch on fire in two years. Paul Johnson wants to know a good way to tell the banded end of an orange drop cap. Yeah, the easiest way, and there are other ways involving scopes and all kinds of stuff, but the easiest way for most people to do that, if you want to know what the what end of an orange drop has the uh, outer foil end, is you take the cap and it has two legs, and you alligator clip the, those leads to a jack. So... Uh, this lead goes to the tip, this lead goes to the sleeve. And that jack gets plugged into a guitar cable, which goes into the input of an amp. And you hold that capacitor between your fingers, and you listen to the amp. You're going to hear some level of noise. You take the power cable from that amp, and you cross that cap with it at 90 degrees. So the AC from the wall is going through that power cable. The amp is on. You you hold it up next to the body of the, capa of the cap, and you listen to the noise field. You put the power cable down, 
you reversed which clip is going to uh, which lead. So this clip lead was positive, now it's negative and vice versa. And you do the same thing. And you bring that cable up to the, uh, to the cap. Whenever, whichever position uh, you have the least noise when that AC power cable is close to that body and touching the body of that capacitor, the, the quietest position was when you had the, the lead which was connected to the outer foil going to, to ground. So that's when you can put a little dot on that side. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, just like here's the cap and here are the leads. So th there's the cap, there are the leads. All right, bring the AC cable there. Some noise. Flip it around. Still positive. More noise. Oh, that one, whichever one was going to ground there, that's the, that's, that's the outer foil. That's the easiest way to do it. You can do that. You can batch test caps that way. You could do it more fancy than alligator clips, but that, that's probably fine for what you guys are doing. I think it is time to take another seven minute break and then we'll get to PF's question. So see you guys in just a few.
Uh, the live stream sponsored by coffee, and I forgot to get more coffee. I meant to get more coffee while I was up. I got distracted. Um, I came back a bit early, try to get through as many questions as possible. Uh, hey, PF, building a rainy day variation on a Gibson GA5 using a 12X7 instead of the S6 SJ7. Thinking about adding a bypassable tone stack between the preamp and volume. Go for it. Uh, you know, it's, you're building your own thing. Um, you can even make it variably bypassed. Uh, if the mids pot is big enough, it, like I mentioned on the Fender thing, at lower volumes, it gives you a mid control. At higher vol, at, you know, lower settings from like noon down, <coughs> it gives you variable mids. Above a certain point, it pretty much defeats the tone stack, though the treble uh, can still be your friend for such things. Uh, but, you know, there's no rules. If you're building your own, Go for it. Uh, bypassable, hard bypassable uh, can be t too big a gain in, uh, difference to, depending on the voicing. You know, some people are initially really impressed by, wow, look at, listen to all that gain with if you just bypass the tone stock. But then eventually realize that's kind of sloppy gain. It's not focused. It doesn't necessarily work as well as sculpted gain. So... Um, and that's the kind of, once you get to that point, then you're like, oh, well, what can I do about that? That's when you make your own discoveries, and that makes the whole process so much fun. Let's see. Well, Matt, I saw you talking about the Princeton Reverb um, being what the, Lazy J was trying to be not really the Lazy J is a five E three uh, with poorly added reverb and poorly added tremolo useless tremolo in that thing and uh, six L six L sixes because uh, fire codes schmark schmark codes but um, there's a huge difference in sound between the Tweed circuit and the and the Princeton reverb. Um, there's nothing wrong with what Lazy J tries to do. In fact, uh, if you listen to that uh, video of Christian playing yesterday, that Victoria uh, Silver Sonic, that's what Lazy J is promising you. Only Victoria knows how to build an amp. There's a big difference in everything except the price. The, the Victoria is a $3,200 amp. The Lazy J is like $2,700. And uh, that's $2,700 that you'd be wasting on the piece of shit Lazy J. Get the Victoria. And if anyone wants to sue me over that, feel free. I'm more qualified. And, uh, you know, that's not just some, like, opinion, man. That's, like, science and shit. Bring it. As he gets sued. Hey, uh... <laughs> Hey, Scott, that, you didn't have to do that. Thank you very much. Scott came down this morning from Wisconsin to get his 67 Super Reverb, not Super Reverb, sorry, Baseman, uh, which, if I can say so, sounds great, and that Yamaha, and uh, one of the last Mesas that will ever be here. I will not be taking any more Mesas in, uh, I'm pleased to say. But thank you very much, Scott. I, I, it was very nice to see you again, and... Uh, I think you're going to love all that, um, the, the amp and the Yamaha for a very long time. Uh, Wonder World Guy says, a Boss Katana sounds nothing like any of the JC amps. Well, I got I got a... I got it, and, and Joe's agreeing with him. I gotta, I gotta say, no, no. I, I used to own a JC120. I gigged with a JC120. I've played the katana. I'm surrounded by amps. You wouldn't hear any difference in a recording of me playing the katana with that kind of thing dialed in, or versus me playing the JC120, unless you notice that the, one of them was noisier than the others. So that would be the JC120. Uh, I, I, I'm. I'm not just making stuff up here, guys. I've, I played a JC120. I owned a JC120. I hauled around in the back of my Honda Civic for 10 years. It's not that good an amp. I'm sorry. It's just not. The speakers are, are crap. It's got no headroom. It's noisy. 
it was a it was a time that time has passed. If you disagree, that's great, but the the katana is a much better app choice. Thanks, Briggs Mech. I appreciate that. I uh, see you in 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 uh, other channels chats, and I never know what to call you because Briggs Mech seems so I don't know cold and mechanical. Let let me know your name, man. I appreciate that very much. Hey, Louis de Jesus. He's replacing the, the electrolytics in his Princeton Reverb reissue. Uh, yeah, add a 470K uh, uh, to uh, pin 7 of V4B. Uh, that would make your life better. If, if you're going to lift the, the, the uh, main board, there's a 1 meg uh, uh, grid leak at that same point. So change that 1 meg to 470K as well. And if you want to be even... Sneakier, change the 22 nanofarad ahead of that to a 4.7 nanofarad. Let's see. Scott Brockway, two rocks are great. If you can afford them, they're fantastic choices. If you can't afford them, there are other things which will be really good. You know, as I said, um, either in the previous live stream or the one before that, uh, two rock is great for a lot less money. You can get say a 76 super reverb and get it fixed up, brought back to where it ought to be. And the guy who plays the two rock will sound just like himself through the 76 as well. You know, I mean, through, through the, uh, you know, the, it's a, a two rock is a specific flavor of a very good amp, but it's not the only very good amp out there. Uh, I think that the pricing is fair given what's, the company is and what they're building for you and with all the switching combinations and how well executed everything is, but it is not necessary to have a two rock to have a good sounding reliable amp. And, uh, uh, I think I used him as an example, Jeff McElwain, who sounds fantastic through his, his two rocks would sound fantastic. If he were here playing through that 66 super reverb that came in the other day, once that super six, that 66 super reverb, has, has, has got the reverb issue sorted. Uh, but he would also sound great through the, my theoretical $800 Craigslist 76 Super Reverb that you then put two to $300 in getting it fixed up. And here we have Charles Willis with a 75 silver face. Uh, okay, so he's got a 75 twin. The normal channel and vibrato channel have separate cathode resistors and caps. Uh, with changing the 1.5k on the normal to 800 tw to 20 ohm, make it more of a lead channel. It won't make. It'll give you a slight increase in 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 gain, not a ton, not a ton more. You may not notice the difference between 1.5k and 820 on on a twin, uh, but feel free to experiment with it. Um, it. You know, on paper, it's more gain. In practice, uh, some of that. Some of the difference in gain and the difference in loading is kind of offset by the plate-driven tone stack, which follows that. Um, oh, actually, the shared one would be on the second stage. I'm trying to think. You may or may not hear any difference. Um, you'd hear, you know, no, thinking about it now, you'd hear a slight difference, but it's slight. Go for it. See what you think. Oh, uh, Hall of Cannons. If you have an old JCM-800 that's suddenly quiet, uh, the only thing that you can do or should do is make sure that the preamp tubes are good. You could have a one-week preamp tube or one almost dead preamp tube and your entire amp loses signal. And there's only three preamp tubes in there. So change three amp, uh, swap preamp tubes. If that doesn't do it, take it to a tech. There's nothing else really that you can do. Um if you mean by quiet, it means low volume. If you mean there's no output at all, you might have a, a blown HT fuse. But if the fuses are the correct values for the app, uh, the next level for the owner to do on a JCM-800 is just make sure the preamp tubes are, are good. And if that's not, uh, if that doesn't do it, take it to a tech, because that's not the amp to learn about. 
I have no experience of the Black Cat, Bad Cat Club 40R Player Series. Sorry, Black Strat 7. Okay, so you think the G12CSs are too loud and you want a less efficient pair of... Um, I, I, you can play around with a less efficient speaker, like a C12Q. Um, I would con. Uh, this is for your car, though, right? Is this for your car? Is it, no, this is for a. Um, sorry, I'm getting questions from an hour and a half ago mixed up. This was this was in your um, magnetone. Does that amp not have a master volume? If not, um, uh, experiment with it because a, a G12CS is a very efficient speaker. It's like 99 dB. Um, you can find something like a C12Q that's closer to 93, 94 dB, and you'd be a noticeable decrease in, in sound. Um, watch the wattage, though. I, I would need to know the wattage per side. you got to... Um, so... Probably, maybe even something like a Weber 12A125 uh, would do you. But, you know, that's your personal journey. I, I can't, I can't uh, tell you what the magic bullet for you is going to be. As long as, the, as long as it can handle the actual wattage of the amp and the impedance is fine, the rest of it is really subjective. Oh, the 68 Deluxe Reverb uh, basement tone stack is nonsense. It, it's it's the same tone stack as as a, a, a standard DR, only it's got a 22 nanofarad instead of a 47 nanofarad. And then they've got an 18K resistor uh, uh, in series with the 6.8K resistor. You change that, and it, it, it doesn't sound like the, the basement at all. If you change, if you bite, if you jumper that 18, remove the 18K and put a wire in where they cut the trace, so you just have the 6.8K, then you have the, the super reverb normal channel. And you change the 22 to 47, you're back to the, the standard deluxe reverb. Uh, it's, it's, it's all marketing. Um, the baseman, uh, 5F6A baseman, uh, had a variable mid spot and was a cathode follower stage and came at a different point in the app. So it takes a lot more than, than cap and, and pot values to make a tone stack basement, man. All the, all the Deluxe Reverb 68 DR uh, custom channel is, is they change the 47 to a 22, which gives you more lower mids, like you find in the normal channel of Super Reverb, which can be a good thing. Um, and then they put that 18K in there, so it's really uh, nasal and congested with too much gain. Just take out that 18K and jumper uh, from uh, that lug of, of the base pot to the uh, 6.8K. You can see, well, when you remove the 18K, you'll see that they just cut a trace, and you're replacing that trace with wire, and that channel sounds a lot better at that point. Let's see. Yeah, Richard Clark, YouTube is changing the, the options for how I play sads. I'm trying as hard as I can to keep them just the skip and four, three, two, one at the beginning and end of videos. If you start seeing ads at other points, uh, that's beyond my control, and I apologize. I'm trying. Uh, I have no opinion on Mesa Cali Tweeds. James Hartzog, sorry. Let's see. Matty B, I don't have any uh, experience with Victory using EC900 or, or CV4014s. Um, or I've not tried any of their their preamp things. Um, I don't. I've not had time personally to play around with alternate tube types, twelve um, x sevens and six L sixes and 
the other usual suspects are still in production places. So I, I, I tend to stay with things that are in production and uh, some of the m more obscure tube types and hi-fi I just haven't ha had time to play with. Are there any new solid state amps I like, says Tristan Schmuckley. Tristan Schmuckley. Um, I have not tried that many. Uh, I, th I have found the katanas to be playable and usable. Uh, I, I don't think they're perfect. I don't think they're amazing. I think they're, they're great tools. I think that um, the uh, Fender Tone Masters are, and some of the Boss Blues whatevers that are in the eight to 900 range are overpriced. I, I, I find that once you pay that much money, then those weaknesses become much more uh, glaring. And I don't think that they sound appreciably better than the $350, $400 Katanas. Uh, I have not played around with the latest versions from um, uh, Axe FX, you know, um, uh, Fractal or, or Kemper, and I have not uh, had a chance to try like the the um, Helix or HX Stomp with the latest and greatest software stuff. I watch I watch guys like uh, John Nathan Cordy, and I watch uh, Leon Todd to keep an ear to the ground on that stuff, but that's not a game that I, I find myself playing at this point. Maybe at some point I'll, I'll get a little thing to have um, as, an, a, as um, a tool that would be useful for the channel. I checked out the, um, the uh, Universal Audio Ruby and what was the other one called? One's the Vox, one's, one's the, uh, the Deluxe Reverb Dream. And I was whelmed. I, I did not think that they sounded like Voxes or Deluxe Reverbs. Um, in Well, they sound like some things you can do with those amps. Not They didn't do, do everything those amps did. And I didn't think they did everything um, particularly well. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and on the heels of that, it was like, oh, Edge is using them. They must be great. I haven't cared for Edge's sound in about 20 years, so uh, I don't think you could have ever have done Unforgettable Fire or Joshua Tree with uh, a Ruby pedal, but he can do uh, Vegas shows with them, and I'll just leave that there. Let's see. I, I have I have YouTube Premium myself, so I can, so I can stand to to do this stuff, but uh, I do have to have ads on my videos for my videos to be promoted to people. It, you know, and that's fair enough, uh, but I try to do as few ads as, as possible so that I, I don't want to, be, I mean, we're two hours and 20 minutes into this live stream. According to YouTube, you should have already seen at least 10 ads that I have not subjected you to. So uh, if that's important to you, because, you know, I don't want to talk about this shit, but, you know. <laughs> um, um, Brent Horrocks, a tweed era, a tweed fender from the 5F1 era has no noise. If yours has noise, you don't need to add more filtering. You need to look and see what you did that was different from what Leo actually did. Um, a lot of kits get things wrong. When in doubt, look at the actual Fender layouts. And if you go to pages, Mojo Tone's got them up. Uh, the Tube Store has, in the schematic section has not just the Fender schematics, but the, the old Fender layouts. And you can look at photos of old ones. Uh, a properly built 5F1 does not have any noise. Just doesn't have any. Might have some a little bit of heater buzz. You can if you if you wire it with one side grounded like Leo did. You can always do that bipolar. But um, people expect vintage amps to be noisy, and they're not. Scott Wilcox picked up a '67 Basement this morning. He didn't even know it was on until he rolled the volume up on the guitar, and he. he he was used to that app always going bzzz. It doesn't anymore. It's it's silent. He always gets a little white noise at higher volumes, but that's a different thing. That's just how how uh, tubes work. Let's 
Let's see. I have no no uh, experience with K amplifiers, Joey R. Sorry. Hey, Wes. Thanks for joining us. Let's see. Scrolling down to find more questions. Hey, Mike the Bike 675 from Greece. I hear it's the word. It's got groove. It's got meaning. And Galactoporikos. Best speaker replacement for Fender Super Reverb reissue. Um, best would be if to get a, a quad of 60s CTS Alnico's 10 inches with the one and a half inch voice coil and have them reconed. Um, that would also be very expensive, but it would be very good. Uh, most of my clients who don't have the money to get the original Alnico's or don't have the Alnico's that we, we can get reconed have been very, very happy with the uh, WGS G10Cs and the ET10s. And that's what I would recommend for a lot of people. Uh, other people I know have been very happy with the uh, Eminence Little Buddy and the Eminence uh, 1058 and 1078. I think they are one selection, I'm um, sorry, one's uh, um, uh, ceramic, one's Alnico. Um, but those legends, uh, the the two different legends and the and the little buddy from Eminence are all good choices. I like the G10C. If I were to do ceramic speakers in a super reverb, I would probably do the G10Cs myself, or maybe two G10Cs and two uh, ET10s. Uh, but my preference, if I could wave my magic wand and have a super reverb of my own, I'd have four uh, reconed, well reconed. 60, uh, 60 CTS Alnicos. I think that's the sound. Thank you, the other John Brown. That's very nice of you. Nine delays. Well, that would explain why you were so delayed getting here, Wes. Well, Johan Alverson, you have not been looking far enough. Most vendors have 82K plate resistors uh, for the first uh, plate resistor in a uh, uh, the phase inverter. Later vendors uh, in the 12AT phase inverter stages went to 47K plate resistors. And there are other apps which have, have done that. Um, the... Uh, the Vibro uh, Verb uh, had, I think, 91K and 10K with with a split plate, and I think they that's where they got that from for the uh, uh, Blues DeVille, or Hot Rod DeVille. And there are other amps out there uh, which are running lower than 100K, often on other tube types. And there are other amps out there that run uh, to 20K or 470K for the plates, depending on other aspects of the design. But um, 100K is something which is usually a pr pretty common because uh, with the 12X7, the load line was, was published for that. You can say, okay, that's exactly where I want this thing to, to bias. I'll, I'll just use the 100K, and, I, th and I, I know what the supply voltage I need to get is, and uh, 100K, and then I'll choose behavior of that by varying the cathode at that point. Um, but... Uh, it's it's almost just a, a popular convention because it makes other decisions easier. The Jupiter MTCP is a variant on the uh, uh, WGS G10C. Uh, uh, WGS makes the Jupiters, um, but yeah, either one of those would be great. I've not tried the uh, the uh, SC64. Um, but I bet it would be a great choice. Um, the um, Alessandro uh, eminences that I have heard have been really nice. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate that.
Let's see. Hey, Sturgis, yeah, the, the cock amp was heavier than, than Lewis Electric, but the cock amp worked better than Lewis Electric. Uh... Uh, well, the, the DSL-40C and the 100H are very different amps, Big Boss. I don't think the 100H has reverb. And the 40C is, is much more portable for most people. And there are a few places these days when you can uh, play more than 40 watts out. So um, the 100H, I don't know. It's, it's an awful lot. Alex Lifeson has a new app by Mojotone and Omega. Any thoughts? Yeah, I was talking to the guys at Mojotone about that, but they, they hadn't released it yet, so they didn't give me any details. And um, I don't know any more than that, the, other than uh, he tends to have them make JCM 800 and, and Silver Jubilee variations. I don't know which, which one he went for. Uh, I'm sure that I will see lots of videos about it and ads about it. And as much as I love... Alex Lifeson, you know, he's retired on one on the one hand, on the other hand, or more or less retired. Uh, but you know, the what, the body of work is there. It was not done with those amps. Um, similarly, every time Epiphone comes out with an Alex Lifeson model and they sell out in a week, I'm like, okay, whatever. But you know, he that's not what he ever used. So, uh, if whatever he, you know, if if he's making money off his legacy and he's not hurting anyone in the process, that's great. Uh, it's just it's a different thing than if it had come out with the Alex Lifeson amp in 1982. And I think if he were here, he he he'd understand what I'm saying, and uh, he'd be he'd be cool with all that. Uh, but uh, you know, I I'm never gonna criticize Mr. Lurkst. But um, the impact of, of an Alex Lifeson app in 2023 is a, a bit dimmed um, compared to how it would have been even 20 years ago. Oh, thank you, Victor. That's very kind of you. What is the tonal difference between LC and RC filter in the power supply, given they attenuate the same dBs of AC ripple and B plus after is the same? Um, he's asking what the difference between... Uh, using a resistor for a choke versus using an inductor as a choke. I'm, I'm, that's a bad way of phrasing it. Uh, resistor uh, or a choke, basically. So you look at, say, a 5B3 Deluxe or a, we'll say a Princeton Reverb. Princeton Reverb's got a 1, 1K, 1-watt uh, resistor in the same place where Deluxe Reverb has got a, um, a, about a 3 Henry choke. The 3 Henrys means that's, uh, that's a measure of a unit of inductance for those who don't know. I have heard an awful lot and read an awful lot typed and said about the magical qualities of chokes or the uh, feel differences with the resistor. And in a few apps, I have built them to be switchable because I wanted to know. And what I have found is that to get the same reduction of, of uh, ripple, to get the same uh, noise suppression out of a resistor that you get with a choke, you either need to have a lot more resistance or you need to have a lot more capacitance. So with a choke, you've got a physically large, heavy, you know, compared to resistor, expensive these days compared to resistor component that doesn't require as much capacitance after it. Or you can have a very inexpensive small component, say a, a, a 1K resistor or 500 ohm resistor, and depending on the current through it, it can be anything from 1 watt to 10 watt. But you would then need more capacitance to get the same behavior from it. And so when you change capacitance, you're changing other factors, many of which impact the player. And so the player is going to say, well, the choke feels this way and the resistor feels this way. Well, that's the thing, that's the variable that may seem different to the player, but 
behind the scenes there may be different capacitance. For instance, in a Vox AC15 traditionally had a choke, but it was a choke before um, the uh, uh, output transformer plates, before the power tube plates and the output transformer primary. So that choke's got a lot more current through it in old AC15. And then you get, say, an AC15 hand-wired where it has a choke, but it is um, done like a 15-watt version of AC30, so the choke is after the plate, so it's a lot less current through the choke, where well, you're going to hear a lot less difference between choke and resistor in the AC15 hand-wired than you would in a 1962 AC15. Uh, but say that AC15 hand-wired, it's got a, a first stage, and it's got... 47 uh, microfarad of capacitance, and the, then it's got a choke, and the next stage has got 22 microfarad of capacitance, versus the AC15 custom, which is, the circuit is much like the hand-wired, except you've got uh, 47 microfarad of capacitance, then a resistor instead of a choke, but then instead of having 22 microfarad of, of filtering, you have 100 microfarad of filtering, because they need more filtering after the resistor, because the resistor is not as effective as a choke. Well, that changes the feel of everything, and if you decrease the capacitance, then you, uh, to get the feel closer, then you, you introduce hum, um, and I'm going on at length. Either can be fine, and you have to find the right balance between capacitance. Um, and 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 uh, resistance to get the same feel that you had with the previous system, but it's not just a matter of changing L versus R. It's L in, in conjunction with C versus R in conjunction in conjunct, uh, 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 conjunction with C. I love the way the AC fifteen C one sounds and feels, and so uh, I think they've got a a one k five watt. Resistor taking the place of a choke, and they've got 100 microfarad, and that's fine. Um, I I don't find that this. I don't think the same circuit would work if you're building an actual replica of the 62 AC15, where you've got reservoir, uh, you've got uh, reservoir cap, then choke, and then the second cap is where the screen and and uh, primaries of the output transformer are connected, because there's a lot more current through that. I'm um, just wondering at this point. It's just really hard to talk about this stuff without being able to show and draw and do math. Alex uh, 2112, I'm glad you're getting your uh, some good sounds out of your Origin 20. Uh, I do think it would it would require different speakers than the than the than the stock uh, combo, but you got that covered. And other people are talking about uh, angles and of mics and stuff. So I'm I'm never gonna get caught up. I'm never gonna get caught up current to the questions. Um, so someday we'll get all the questions answered. But I don't think we're gonna be. I don't think it's gonna be today. The rugged Lyle look. Uh, the Lyle needs to shave look is what you mean. Uh, what are your thoughts about changing voltage values with an Amp RX brown box when vintage amps are powered on? I don't know because um, I've not had the brown box in front of me. I don't know whether it's safe to do or not. Um, uh, I would I would find out for sure before you do that. Uh, odds are, though, you, it's going to be going to you know, it's either going to be going between 115 and 120, which is safe for the app, or it's going to go from 115 to nothing to 120, which would still probably be safe to the app. But just verify that. But uh, I don't have one here to test myself. Well, Wes is Wes likes his AC15 C1X and his, but he prefers his 1967 Deluxe Reverb. Well. You have to get me to get get you a uh, build you a sixty seven AC fifteen Wes, and then you'd have a apples to apples comparison. Yeah, your sixty seven deluxe reverb should be better than a five hundred dollar AC fifteen C one X. But the important thing is that uh, I guess with the X it'd be a eight hundred dollar app. But you know, 
for the money, the, 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 the Vox Custom 15 and 30 series are just amazing. Diabetes. Coffee doesn't cause diabetes, Scott. Let's see. Trying to see if there's any more questions. Fred R., I will be accepting work again soon, but I'm not going to be doing very many Fender reissues. Um, or I'm going to be doing fewer of them. I'm trying to get more um, vintage and higher end amps in. Uh, I have given information out uh, to, to, sh to show people how to have a lot of the work done to their reissues already. It's just not something I, I want to do a lot of. And I don't mean to be um, sounding elitist and all, but I don't know. I feel like I'm never going to, I don't ever want to work on a Blues Junior beyond the one I'm finishing up for someone. I don't want to take any more Maces in. I don't want to do any more Hot Rod Deluxes. I've done my time. If I do a reissue for fin Fender Amp for someone, I will occasionally because I think they're good things for musicians to have, but it's not interesting to me to do yet another one. Um, I'm trying to get, build this up to the point where I have more interesting things and it's a little less like getting paid to change tires. I'm glad to get paid to do this. If I need to change tires, I'll do it, but I've, I've changed so many tires. I want some of these, I want more race cars now. I like the race cars. I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm 52. I've been doing this a long time. I might have earned some really nice ones now, and I'm going to try to focus on getting more and more of those. Not that a 65 reissued Deluxe Reverb or Princeton Reverb isn't a nice amp for someone. I've always tried to respect everyone's amp. Yeah, it's their means of expression, and it's not about the money. But there's only so many reissues I want to put back to how they should have built it from the factory. Uh, I wish Fender would just build them right from the factory. Hey, Michael Scott BDs, or BDS. Uh, the AC15 schematics online are blurry and difficult to read. Can I recommend one which is legible and sounds good? Uh, I mean, uh, I have not looked for the, J I mean, the JMI AC15 schematic. I have not even looked online. Let me see. Let's do that. Let's call, call, Google, calling up Google. JMI AC15 schematic. I'm going to go to EL34 World, which is usually a good form for such thing. Image removed. And people sharing bad information with each other. Okay, that's good. Let's see, the tube store often has good resources. AC15, 1960. Make it bigger. Yeah, it's a, it's a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. Xerox. Um, well, it's out there. I'll show you what, what I would actually recommend you do. Let me find the book. This may piss people off because I'm going to give you just a glimpse, but A Service Engineer's Guide to the a Vox AC30 Valve Amplifier, revised edition, includes AC15, AC10, and AC4 by Stephen Grosvenor. This is available on Amazon and other places on the internet. I could, I could give you a screenshot of it, and then you wouldn't have to buy this book, but it's a very good book, and he made them, and I think he deserves to get paid for his work because he did very, very good work. But uh, at the risk of pissing you off, let's scroll to it. Here's the 1960 AC15 schematic, clear and legible. 
comes with the layout, comes with all the parts, comes with photos of the, of the app, some history, what to expect to see inside the chassis, and then it goes to the AC-10. So if you, if you really want to work on an on AC-30, AC-15, AC-10, or AC-4, this is the book to get. It's not that expensive, and I think Mr. Grosvenor did a fantastic job and deserves to uh, be compensated for it. You guys are talking about whiskey. Wes Chilton says, if they arrest me for insulting Lazy J, we'll start a GoFundMe to bail me out and cover my lawyer. Well... We, we uh, if you guys bail me out, we'll take that money and we'll go look at that whiskey conversation. Uh, my mom's an attorney, and about eighty of her friends are the top lawyers in town. So uh, I don't think I need to worry about the lazy J police. Uh, I do think that lazy J should be worried about what would happen if uh, a European inspector were to ever look at how that exported amp was built. Uh, uh, same thing goes for Australia. I think the fine per, per unit is extraordinary. Uh, they are definitely not observing any electrical codes. Let's see. See you, Matt. I say that. He probably left an hour ago. Briggs Mech is James. Okay. Uh, Briggs Mech, James. I'll try to remember that. I try to remember the real names except for Anus McDingleberry or whatever it was earlier today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call him that because uh, that was too good. Uh, man, he's talking about whiskey, and I'm thinking I need more coffee. Uh, Fletch is 40. In, any insights into the high watt issue I wrote you about recently? I apologize. I've not seen the, uh, an email about a high watt I am having a hard time keeping up with the emails. I get so many a day, and by the time I start to answer some, then if I answer them for real, then I've spent 20 minutes answering three emails, and others have come in, and then I've got, and then the next email is, hey, is my, is my thing done yet? So I go back to work. I need three more me's, uh, and I don't have them. Anyway, he says, turns the treble fully clockwise, and the signal drops out. I'm guessing a bad cap or, ground, or pot in the signal leaking the signal. I uh, la la cap. Me talk good one day. I'm guessing a bad cap or a pot in the circuit leaking the signal off to ground. I doubt that. I think you might have severe oscillation happening. Uh, if the signal drops out when you turn the treble fully clockwise, it's possible you have a bad pot, but it's also possible that that's, it, the amp's really unstable and you're just oscillating to the point where it cuts out. A scope will tell you, or if every dog in your neighborhood starts to cry at the same time, uh, take it to a tech if necessary. I do not know about sour sound transformers. Uh, I'm glad that they say they make the best 5v3 replica output transformer in the market, but there's not anything special about a 5v3 output transformer. It's a little little bitty thing. But maybe they make the best... N nothing special little little thing in the world. That'd be great. Hey, Christopher, I don't, I don't keep up with the lowest end of the market. Like, I mean, mono price is throwaway. You've answered it yourself. Um, I would just buy a classic 20 and, 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 and keep it going as long as possible if you like that sound. Otherwise, get a Tweed Champ. It's a better amp. Hey, Joe, yeah, I have experience with volume pedals. Um, the one I like the best currently, um, for a multitude of reasons, is the um, Boss Volume X, not Boss, sorry, Dunlop Volume X. It's got a metal belt drive that's much, much more reliable and, and feels better, to me at least, than the, uh, the string on the Ernie Ball. 
It sounds really good. Uh, the caveat with the Volume X is that you have to calibrate it. As it comes out of the box, it's not always calibrated properly, and, and calibrating it is kind of a, a pain in the butt. But once you get it, oh, the stars to align, it locks in that way, and it sounds really good. And it, it looks really good, and it lasts, and I've not had any issues, and I've got three of them. So that's the one I like. I, I've never cared for the Boss ones. Uh, the Boss ones always feel like the plastic that they are. Yeah, Eric, the, the, the trademark uh, uh, 60 from T Tech 21 is a pretty good sounding solid state amp. I, I've played them. I've, I've never heard a sound out of them that made me want to get one, but I can see the appeal. And if I were to show up to someone's house or sit in with them on a gig and they said, hey, you play, you, are you capable of playing through that? I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'll be fine. Thank you very much. Um, it, it's nothing that made me want to get one, but nothing that made me want to stay away from it. I have not uh, been inside one, and um, I hope that there's nothing scary inside them. Some of their pedals, the way they're constructed, were horrifyingly bad. Let's see. Oh, Saved by Grace. If you got noise and a distortion in the reverb, it could be the tank, but it's probably the low voltage power supply. I'm sorry. It's just so often the low voltage power supply. Slick Salmon, no, I, I do not like the, the Marshall Origin series. Um, they don't sound good. They don't sound like Marshalls. And as you turn down the master volume, they get clean, which is not a very useful thing to have in a Marshall. Um, I don't understand the Origin series. For the same price or slightly more, you can get the DSL 40 which is a much better amp, and it sounds good. Let's see. Eric the Bolt, uh, choosing tubes today comes down to what's actually in stock more than anything else, um, with a few caveats. Electro harmonics, uh, this, the yellow labeled 12x7s are garbage. The uh, silver labeled 7025s are usually okay. Avoid Russian tubes um, in a, a cathode follower stage. Stick with Chinese or, or Slovakian. Uh, JJs, generally good. Um, have been prone in the last couple of years to, going, uh, to losing vacuum. Uh, JJ 6V6s in combo amps tend to go microphonic, fine in a head. Um, never pay extra for Gold Lion. Never pay extra for anything saying that it's, it's cryogenically blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are only three manufacturers of tubes in the world. There's a Russian plant which does the new sensor stuff, and that's Tungsol, um, Electroharmonics, Sovtec, and Mullard. There's a Chinese plant now called Pizvain, who also does Tube Amp Doctor. The Tube Amp Doctor also sources some of their tubes from JJ. And the Slovakian plant is JJ. And that's pretty much it. And if you buy a Groove Tubes, it's actually a JJ. If you buy a Ruby, it's either a JJ or Electro Harmonics or a Softec. If you buy a Gold Lion, it's a $20 JJ with a different artwork and different box that they sell you sell it to you for 80 bucks. I don't know if it's JJ. It may be a soft tech, but there's not a Gold Lion tube factory in the world. It's, it's, there's so much marketing and misapprehension out, the, out there. Uh, uh, new old stock has been heavily picked over at this point. Um, the best thing I can tell you is find a vendor that you can have a relationship with and, and trust. And so don't buy tubes from Amazon. Don't buy tubes from eBay unless you have a tube tester and know what you're doing. Don't buy tubes from Musician's Friend or Z Zounds or Sweetwater or um, uh, uh, Guitar Center. Buy from the tube store. Buy from Tube Depot. Buy from Magic Tubes. Buy from Euro Tubes. Buy from t people who sell tubes. That's their entire business model. Get to know them. Call up and say, hey, Bob, it's me, Joe. I've got, or in this case, Eric. I uh, got a deluxe reverb. What, what 6L6s, I mean, 6V6s do you recommend? 
because they're going to know that, hey, we sold, of these brands, the ones we sold for Deluxe Reverb users, hey, we had a lot of returns on the JJs. We haven't had any problems on the Tunk Sols. You know, they're going to know that. And they're going to be able to say, well, okay, uh, well, do you know about this? Or you could say, hey, I heard on the internet, this guy was saying, don't buy a Russian tube for a cathode follower. What's a Russian tube? And why not? Because uh, cathode follower stages in a Marshall or a Vox or other amps, or some fenders like the 5F6A, have 150 to 200 volts on the cathode. And s some tubes, primarily tubes made in Russia today, cannot handle sustained higher voltages on the cathode like that, and the tubes die. Whereas the, the Chinese and, and Slovakian tubes are fine. Let's see. Well, uh, Bebop, probably the problem is the logo where it says Mesa Boogie. And if it hums, that is the least of your problem, but problems, but it could be almost anything in one of those. It could be a failing filter cap, much more likely to be a f uh, failing uh, or burnt diode. Uh, Mesas just have so much garbage in them. Uh, it could also be leaking uh, DC through a filter cap where there's a 400 volt cap that's had more than 400 volts across it. Um, take your Mesa to a, te to a tech, have them fix it, and then sell it while, while people are still buying Mesas for, for crazy prices. But they're just garbage, and I, I despise them. See, Josh Roberts, I only gave you the, the short version of that because I'm trying to wrap it up. Do I have a favorite undertones track? I don't know what undertones is. I assume it's a band, but I have not heard them. I'll check them out though, Eves. See, this is the thing, Mike the Bike. He says it's called Galactoburico. I went to a Greek restaurant called La T the Taverna here, Milos Taverna in Memphis. It's not been here for 15 years, but I used to love that place. And he pronounced it Galactoporikos. Uh, and as, so if you guys can all agree on what to call it, I'll call it whatever you tell me. But um, the guy who used to run that place called it Galactoporikos with a P. And um, I'll, anyway, if you make it, I'll eat it, and you can spell it any way you want. Galactoporico, Galactoporicos. All I know is I haven't had any in 20 years, and now I want some. I'm going to have to find a recipe to figure out how to make it. It would be an early Christmas present to me, uh, but not probably to my heart. But um, I do try to keep up. But uh, I remember on the menu, Galactoporicos is how he spelled it. He might have been illiterate. I don't know. He was a good cook, though. Oh, y'all saw that? I, I guess I guess it was visible when I stood up. Oh no, it's not visible. You know what? Okay, Zombie Archive. I think I know who you are now. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, that's right. That's that's you, man. <laughs> Sorry. All right, that's Sam, the guy who who brought in that '66 uh, uh, Super Reverb. Let me show you what he's talking about. Sam and his dad are really cool. And his dad made this, and he, it came with a bottle of wine and a Pinot Noir, which we very much appreciated. But he made this. And I'm going to see about putting some wax paper inside and some LEDs and having, it's a lamp. It's a major award, just in the background of videos and such. So I really do appreciate it, Chip and Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, but I wanted, I was going to do a debut with the just kind of quietly in the background working with the soft glow of electric sex. Sorry, it is that time of year. Some of you know what I'm referencing. But it's very cool of you, Chip. Thank you, Sam. 
All right. Hey, Victor B., did we miss your birthday? Mahalo. Aloha, etc. Hope you got laid. Uh, Australian jokes never get tired. Thank you very much, Fletch's 40. Appreciate that. And Raphael. Hey, Raphael. He's got a triad V2 and the Telus. Oh, yeah, the V2 triad was my favorite of, of the triads, definitely, because it wasn't this big. Obrigado, man. Obrigado. David A. in su sunny southern Australia. Uh, saved by Grace. How do you like the Jensen C12N for Fender amps? I've not tried the, the new one very much. The old ones from the 60s were phenomenal. And I'm sure that the uh, the current ones are good. I, I would say, given the um, track record of modern Jensen, I would be more inclined to spend my money on the Alessandro or the uh, WGS uh, G12C, which I know are also variations on the C, the old C12N. I just haven't heard any modern Jensen's that really knock my socks off. But uh, I know the C12N has got to be better than the C12Q, and they are all better than the C12K. Thanks, Bebot. Uh, sorry, I, you gave me a super chat, and I, and I gave you a smarmy answer. It's, but it's, behind the smarm, it's true. Uh, there's just so much that can go wrong with maces. Uh, we'll see my amps under $1,000 video as to why I wasn't recommending a mesa there. Um, but there's just so much that can and will and predictably is going to go wrong. And then you get on online to find out why my amp does this. And there's the, the call to Mesa saying, it's the price you pay for tone, man. You just don't know how to dial it in. And it's, it's just bad design. Uh, beyond that, unless I had your amp in, I, could, I couldn't tell you more than that. And I, I'm not going to have your amp in because I'm not going to work on any more Mesas because life is short. And I want to enjoy my life more and think well of people. Thank you, James Maxwell. That's very kind of you. All right. I'm going to try to wrap it up because we're right here now at three hours. I may not be able to get to all of them. James Maxwell, uh, self-biasing holes, but no idea what it's supposed to be biased to. Uh, contact Kendrick to ask what... Uh, measurement you should you should be get, expect to get there with, with a dc meter uh beyond that take it to a tech i think i think self-bias uh, uh or, or rather owners uh, bias measurement holes for owners make no sense to me because the owner's not going to have all the factors the owner's not going to qualify to bias and a tech can a good tech can bias in that properly very quickly i think external bias measurement points just create confusion and encouraged uh, owners to make mistakes. Joby, a 1966 Pro Reverb. Uh, the AC shunt, you don't use an AC... Sh Are you talking about the, if you're talking about the cap in the ground switch, don't use a ground switch cap. Uh... Unless you're talking about the 200 volt, um, uh, the 0.1 microfarad 200 volt cap in the phase inverter input, in which case you can use a, two, a 0 0.1 630 volt, yeah. Um, but well, the 0.1 200 volts is would be DC on the on the uh, phase inverter input. Um, you then need to have, in general, if it's right. You can always use a cap that's rated for more than, than what's on the schematic. So you, if in the phase inverter input, the 200 volt, 100 nanofarad, 0.1 microfarad on the schematic could also be a 630 volt, but you don't want to, you can't replace the 630 volt with the 200 volt. But if you're talking about um, a shunt as in to ground, like uh, on the ground polarity switch, so that's usually a, a, a 0.047, you don't want to use that in an app. But I would, Need more information from you to be able to answer your question better. Oh my God, I love you. Thank you, thank you so much. A late coffee fairy. Not you, Joby, though you're great. <laughs> uh, the coffee fairy. 
No, no, I didn't mean to break your heart there, Joby. I know we've, well, we've only just met, but and I'm sorry if I uh, went went on at length there. Yeah, DR103 is is a race car, and uh, I'll look for I'll look for your email, Fletches, and see if I can find it, and we can continue. Thanks, Chris Butler. Yeah, those I got some serious C stands there, and I've got a uh, a big wall mounted angle bracket holding the light up here. It's, you can you can't see the light, but you can you I mean you can see the effect of the light. I've got a lot more stuff going on in the channel than makes it in the videos, but it makes makes the videos possible. Uh, someday we'll get a tour going on here. Uh, those C stands aren't what you'd find on a film set. You know, those are. $150 C-stands as opposed to $1,500 C-stands. But uh, they do the job for me, and I've, I've got some sandbags I need to fill uh, to get a little bit of the last of the wobble out. And they're, they're already on some suspension isolation blocks, but I need to get, I need to get a, some sandbagging going on. But, uh, you know, I try not to talk about the camera geekery stuff too much here, but it, it really has been a, a major part of my life for the last six months plus. All right, um, I think we're going to wrap this up, and I, I hope we'll, uh, you know, Fletch is 40. I'm going to look for your, your, your stuff with the, uh, um, uh, the DR-103. But it looks like from the chat, people are talking about my tubes. Aerojad said I froze for him, but I don't think I... I don't think I don't think it's gonna be for everyone. All right, yeah, we're almost caught up. This is amazing. Okay, Dr. Russ at least caught my reference. The whole neighborhood was turned on by the soft glow of electric sex. Oh, fudge! I guess that's gonna be on TV forever soon. Let's see. Uh, yeah, um, everyone give me a like if you don't mind. It, it, it does help. Um, it tells tells YouTube to tell other people who have similar watch histories to you guys that I exist. Unless we buy uh, C stands, and I need more. I need another camera. I need a, a B, a really good quality B camera. So. Next time I get a great player coming in, I can do the, like the panning shot or zoom in on the hands and then go back to the other full thing. I'm trying to compete with the uh, the Paul Davids and other uh, channels like that where they have like three or four cameras and three or four guys working the cameras and they have a videographer and, a, and another guy is just doing the lighting and all that stuff. And it's just me. Huh, 180, 181 likes. That is pretty damn good. I appreciate you all. Um all right, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks very much to everyone for being here. Next Sunday, the amazing, the talented, the lovely Ted Woodford will be on here for the fourth edition of Technical Difficulties. I've really been looking forward to this. I really admire Ted very much and his work ethic, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting him pretty much at the same time you guys do. And uh, it, it should be Brad interviewing him because... Brad does the woodworking, but if it was Brad interviewing them, they'd probably just go off about uh, which which uh, uh, grade of rasp to use and which Japanese saw is the best, and the rest of us would be going, what, are they, what the hell are they talking about? So I'm going to try to translate between Master Luthier and the rest of us schmoes, and I put myself in the schmo category, but... Uh, Try not to ask Ted questions that Google would tell you in two seconds, and don't ask what's what if, if what what's his favorite Martin, or should he get a Martin versus a Takamini? Try to think of questions uh, that only he can answer that aren't quite so generic, or or just listen. We'll see how it goes. How he may just give us a ton of information. Uh, if you're not familiar with his videos, spend this week watching T. Woodford on, on YouTube. 
a phenomenal, phenomenal guitar repairman, uh, master, master of his craft, primarily acoustics, but also electrics, and he's funny as fuck. And it's not something you hear very often. He does the world's best Werner Herzog impression. When you hear it, you won't believe how good it is, but it'll make you pine for the fjords. See you guys.